Oh, the excitement's so high. How do I? Okay. okay. But the thought is some of some of the stuff gets the other words. So which one That's are you? The Müller. What a good guess. I, I might even have got that. <laughs> okay, so if you want, that'll change the slides. And, and here's a pointer if you want. So um, this is kind of continuing Jan Luger's story uh, about doing detailed theoretical modeling on a contaminant screen site using DCIP, theology, and some chemical data. And there's been a bunch of people, a bunch of people involved in this and a lot of in different places. Um, so Lucas showed data from Grenstein and they have in the uh, eastern part of the town, a chemical factory, which has been, I guess there's still one there, but <coughs> they, at some time, while you didn't think about what you did with your waste and your processed water and so on, they just dumped it at the site. And then it has been flowing down into the ground. Then we have some containing confining clay layers at about 80 meters depth. So it's going down, and because we have a stream here in the town, we also have a map up here. Excuse me, Sarah, where where were you? Is this where you were living? Uh, no, you show an example from Samsung. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it couldn't explain something. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, all right, I got it. Uh, and this was, uh, it's a, uh, they, they made uh, pharmaceuticals, so it was, for instance, uh, sleeping girls and so on. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they might be very sleepy, the people that live there close to the stream. The and then it, because of the, the water coming up to the stream, the, of course, the contaminants come up as well. But, you know, now I realize that it's not just the other aquifer, or, or they saw it at some time, it's all this <coughs> aquifer. But that this aquifer here around the stream, that's contaminated, but this one is also contaminated. And it's two, the contaminants that they find are not the same. They might have, some of them might be degradation products, so if they come back, but you have to look at these as two different rooms. So, to be able to actually figure out what is going on, is everything coming up from this side? Or have they dumped something other places? They might have dumped something other places in the town, and they also dumped at the landfill. That was some of the data that, the horrible data, okay. or funny data, or this recording, oh, they the come exotic. from the landfill. Or esoteric. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. okay, that's, uh, that's great. No, that's good. So okay. that we have side here and then we have the side. Um, but the room from the landfill might lead somewhere further out. Um, so someone has to do a flow and transport modeling to figure out if this is coming from here and to both places. And for that we need a detailed 3D theoretical model to put into the, to the flow and transport model. Uh, so we have to look at what data do we have that is available for the model. I zoomed in, so we just see the area around the stream. Uh, we have some boron hydraulic locks. I guess I have put on two cross sections. So you can see that's what we have. We have three boreholes that kind of gets to the bottom of the aquifer, but not completely. And then we have some that's about 30 meters, and then we have some short ones. Uh, for an area that's about uh, 800 by 800 meters for the model. 
then the hydraulic head data in some of the boreholes, but that one, black one. Then we have uh, electrical conductivity taken on the water samples. I think Lucas showed some of those as well. Uh, you have geophysical data. You have an EA, uh, EMI survey for the shallow part. Uh, then we have the DC resistivity uh, profiles that Luca mentioned as well. Five meter electrode spacing and the short detail one for two meter electrode spacing. And the data <coughs> collected in gradient array. And then they have been going through the the advanced processing to get the the longest uh, time series that you can get so we can get spectral information. And then this one I can skip. <laughs> so you can have been going through this in detail and we have been using the spark maximum magnetic conductivity parameterization for for the for the things that we are going to do now. So that we and then we have to decide on which parameters should be used for our modeling. So I've been cross plotting the different parameters. So we have the, uh, the bulk conductivity, the uh, imaginary uh, conductivity, uh, and then we have the tau and the C parameter. And then I have some dots on here where I have related them to borehole utility. We'll look at that later. So first of all, we will don't use the <coughs> tau and the C because we're not sure what what they mean and what to do with them. So we just for those we skip. And uh, then then I like resistivity. So first of all, then we need the the total uh, electrical conductivity, which then you can then calculate for me. And uh, and then when we talk geology, we like that it's resistivity instead of conductivity and uh, so that we use the resistivity uh, instead of the total electrical conductivity and we have the bulk uh, resistivity instead of the bulk conductivity. <coughs> and now we will look at this cost of the total uh, of resistivity versus the uh, uh, imaginary conductivity. And now we have resistivity, and then I just call it charitability to be. Uh, so we have, now we look at how does this relate to charity, where we have a borehole which is in a, close enough to the profile. And I haven't taken into account that we have a resolution issues. So I just brute force that this interval is, we can play, okay, what is the resistivity? It might have been that I still need to get in the middle of it because we have thin layers, we have that cannot be resolved, we have this smooth section, so we will have not the exact activity going all the way to the boundary, but this is just proof for so therefore they are wider than they might be, but that's also what we see in the sections afterwards. Uh, first of all, <coughs> the one that's easiest to distinguish is the mica clay. It gives the lowest resistivity and it gives the highest stability. Also in the contaminated areas, the mica clay will have a lower resistivity than the contaminated sands. Um, then we have a sand chill, which lies in here, which is also have parts that are chargeable and quite low in resistivity, but it's chargeable. Uh, but it's overlap completely with all the other things. Then we have a broad band of black water sands here. And uh, then uh, we have to see what happens when we have the contaminants. So almost all what is below a resistivity of 100 meters might be influenced by contaminants used from the Arctic law an information factor of so that we can see if we have resistivities that are below 100 meters in the sands that's probably why we have the contaminants so that so a lot of the red dots and the uh, 
and the light loop dots in this area is where the contaminants sits. So here's <coughs> one of the uh, short electrode spacing profiles, and we have one borehole which more or less sits exactly on the profile. Um, so this is the uh, bulk resistivity, and this is what we call the total resistivity, and you can see that there are some differences that we have more. This one is more resistant than this one here up here, and that means that we have, and it's also coincident with the with the clay in the boreholes. So this here we can see that we have just from looking at the bulk resistivity and the resistivity which sees the surface conductivity that we have clay here. And uh, if we look at the uh, testability, but that's, we'll be repeating, uh, can look at that, that there are small boxes here which shows the, uh, uh, the conductivity measurement also here. Then Sorry, convert it into a color scale that gives the same order as the uh, the bulk resistivity, and here we see the same as as Jan Lucas showed before. That that's okay. clear evidence, clear that 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 these that what we measured with the surface and what the me other measures in the ball in the lab would, or in in the water samples they give more or less the same. So uh, sorry, can, can we just if, can yeah. we just wind back? Because I think I. I need to make sure I understand. So the bulk resistivity, that's you're, just you're getting, that's from the water. The, that's sort of like the real part of the, yeah. basically the real part of conductivity. The, and then their full resistivity is that plus the imaginary part? Uh, uh, it's a bit more complex. This is where people here always make fun of me because they say that I'm almost uh, close to a uh, very and they come with a new model every week. So. <laughs> It was also oh, a nice day in this model because it came up in your lessons. So the, the MIG model I was showing you is the time in terms of sigma zero, sigma second max. How sigma. Did you write with the pen that we can see? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> so we have sigma zero, sigma second max, how sigma, and C. The problem is that sigma zero is equal to sigma bulk that we can define as sigma water divided by f plus sigma first of omega equal zero. So the BC conductivity is the water conductivity with the information factor and the surface conductivity. And the question is, can we distinguish between these two? And for distinguishing between these two, what we do is, is we use another petrophysical relation found by again, and that's well and many other German researchers, that, and they claim that on a big uh, ensemble of data on unconstructed samples, and also unconstructed sediments, you can find that sigma second of one x, it's quite close to uh, sigma zero, uh, sigma bulk, sorry, sigma bulk, uh, no, sorry. Sigma, sigma first at omega equal zero divided by L. No, multiplied by L. Sorry. So, what is the idea in these two? The idea is that the imaginary conductivity and the surface conductivity, both of them are proportional to the surface area per unit volume. They go with the surface of the grains. Bigger the surface, bigger the the C conductivity of, of the of the surface area and bigger the polarization. And well, this what's L in here? L is 0.042 plus minus <laughs> 0.042. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got that. Yeah. Okay. The Canadians are like so so bad. So <laughs> <laughs> so L is a fantastic phenomenological number that explains a bunch of, of data. And it looks like, it, I mean, when you should look at these plots, they are convincing. And they come from different samples from different parts of the world. And uh, so maybe it's 0.04, maybe it's 0.02. <laughs> but the deviation is quite big. It's not. Yeah. 
yeah. This, is, this is why I run it. <laughs> but again, what is the meaning of this? Okay. You have your grains. So this one will go with the surface of the grains. This one will be a small a small fracture of it will be trapped in, in the pores. At least this is oh, my okay. my, yeah. my my low level understanding of it, right? But again, if you can say that, then we work with cold call. So we say, okay, not a one atom on the peak, because there's the only thing that has a meaning in, in a cold call like model. So we say sigma second max equal L by sigma, by sigma first of it. And with these constraints, you can still build a cold call model where whenever um, you have Six, whenever you have each other building, you have also computing. Becomes through petrophysics, through the, through the petrophysical relation, you force the chargeable layer to be conducted. Okay. And if you do like that, then you can invert for sigma bulk. That means actually slow without the surface conductivity. That means again formation factor. That is what you like for the right conductivity or for estimating water water. So the resistivity that you get would just be like you just take the DC uh, you just so, it, so that yeah, yeah, and then you, we, we have then that sigma zero uh, is equal to uh, sigma bulk plus sigma mm -hmm. first. And this is equal sigma seven max. So you can uh, take both the terms in the conduction. So the, the bulk resistivity would be one over sigma bulk, and the total resistivity would be one over sigma. Yeah. And there are difference because here you have also the conduction to the plane. And this is the well-known problem when you have resistivity only data. Is my resistivity low because I play or because I have Contamination and through IP, you can try to disentangle. Good. So the, <coughs> so the testability section, and it's then you continue pointing out to some extent where it gets the darkest blue is why we have this. The clay. <laughs> this is here so then it's modeled by clay, and because it's not as dark, it's difficult to see in this screen. Um, not as dark here, then the layer, the clay layers get thinner. And we have layers deeper down in the model, but we have to model them exactly only on the borehole because they're so thin that there's no way to resolve them by. The geophysics. Another section here is that we have two boreholes, and here the it gets the clay layer gets thinner, and again so we model it a bit thinner. And we also have in this part here we have the the sandy chill, which is chargeable, and therefore we get this more chargeable in that part here, and then we model it. <coughs> the sand chill in in places where we see that the, the sections get more chargeable a bit a bit higher up and the sand chill and if we have chargeability further down then we model this as the uh, the mica clay. And if we look at the one of the five meter sections we have more boreholes, and we have here in this borehole is quite thin, the clay layer, and which is it's there, but this gets more difficult to see in these sections. And in the other side, it also that we, we still have that that we have. This is the the contaminant that gives rise to the lower resistivity here because we both have it in the bulk resistivity and we have it in the resistivity and the chargeability get less that's less 
to Chelsea as a level the, the player there is, had to be saying that. So that's how yeah. we have been yeah. working with these data to be able to do the yeah. Oracle model. And probably just, yeah, that's how the model looked like. If we look in more details, why we have it more detailed. Later, so in a typical case like this, yeah. so what what sort of time range are you using for inverting the IP decay curves? Time range? And yeah. In terms of start first gate to last gate? Yeah. I think these are four seconds yeah, or four time. seconds. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the first gate would be a two millisecond or something. These were the ones you showed at the screen before. I think it was two millisecond or something. Okay. Something like that. And so two you two or three maybe. I mean, yeah, so a couple milliseconds right <coughs> to yeah. four seconds. Yeah. So that was using. I guess you guys way. never kind of invert. Do you ever invert individual time channels? Or? No. no. Just be. <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting, isn't it? Like you get two different continents and everybody does something completely different. Right? Uh, yeah, it'd be interesting in, like, in data like this, just what you'd get out if you actually did invert individual time channels and just. Uh, you, should, you should get one of these things. Yeah, that, that would actually but, be. But we have done recently, I don't know if you can do that, talk about that was out there a little bit, right? but we also, instead of having the sort of on, off time, and then on reverse and so on, we actually now have a 100% duty cycle. So basically mm -hmm. just the IP ramping up you can say yeah. i mean it's not it's just going from plus one to minus one right. like plus one and then just modeling that instead because then you save you get twice the the um i mean instead of just having one ampere right you get a two ampere difference in, yeah in current. yeah i th i think the industry is gradually getting over to that as a whole for yeah. all their time domain systems but this i don't know I don't want to come home with too many data sets, but th this actually would, might be really nice. This would be a nice comparison uh, of you know what we would be able to get out or not from you know the way we standardly in invert, and that might actually be an impetus to you know change over and do something that's more aligned with with what you're doing, or just at least it would compare them. I, I think mm -hmm. that would be great. Uh, so there's that makes two data sets. Can we can we somehow log log those in? Or otherwise, we just talk about Sorry, and then forget the other one. Uh, the one that John Luca was talk, talking about that had all the. Oh, yeah, sorry. So that's the same area, but this, just the, the landfill. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'll make a note. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> So these are three D data sets. If you want if yeah. even more, yeah, no, that's that's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and especially, that, well, we just need to make sure we know all the things that we need to know about the data to invert them. Of course, because we, if you remember the trouble we had with the Bupernong data, right? Yes. Yeah. I think here we had pretty good handle on Okay. Yeah, we, so we had this, had this sky tan boot per hung data, right? <laughs> so well, sorry, we spe spent 2006, a, uh, pardon me? Yeah, 2006. Yeah, I think so. But so uh, the fact that there were two different ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and uh, the line, not, not all of the parameters were, were known and kept getting out stuff that was a bit shifted. And yeah, the, the person that was doing that at the... Uh, at the time was coming in, Di Quin Yang, and he was just absolutely tearing his hair out, just couldn't figure out what, what it was. And then trying to get communication back and forth between Australia, Aarhus, and UBC is really tough. And uh, yeah, so it, was, it, it kind of fell into the wayside. And then when we visited here a year and a half ago for the uh, for the IP workshop, we were trying to explain what was going on. And people were saying, what? You did that? You know, didn't you know? But yeah, there's these factors in the Aarhus workbench that you have to use to account for all the filtering that's going on. You didn't use that? No. 
<laughs> you know about that? <laughs> the issue is that the Australians might not actually have been informed or conscious about the, the significance of it. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised about how many people do not realize just how complicated it is to model the system response of the scientific system. Yeah. And if you don't model it correctly, well, you might as well not throw the whole authority thing out. So, but from an academic, when we get, you know, we get a, a data set. That's what I meant about you, be surprised. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, you just assume that, okay, you know, here's, here's the waveform, you know, there's no system response in here. You're just taking yeah. it as it is and I go can, ahead, you invert it. And I can tell you, I have been on a, quite a sort of educational tour talking to the people in Australia about just how we have to go to inverse that Well, we should have you come out to UBC. <laughs> we it's a lot of grief. Yeah, yeah, we have had, we had exactly the same exercise with the CGI because they're trying to pre-invert some of the um, recent uh, airborne and phantom data sets in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> we had, uh, Incredible issues with in, in, in They were 2D inverting the data sets, and we did the most insulting contract with them, saying, First, you show us you can do that. If you don't, if you can't do that, that's the end of the contract. Then you show that you can do that. You know, boom, 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 boom. And that's because we knew that a lot of people are not aware of just how you actually know what's going to be and it turned out they couldn't talk to them. So, to do it. Is, is that information somehow posted up so oh, that it's anybody. In single, it's in every single Skype report, and if you are in doubt about things, you can just call Skype. Okay. And then, of course, you have to know what to do with it. But all of the. Uh, information that you need to know with respect to what the system how to, how to work with the system response that's all kind of in that report or at least the system response parameters or just to know what they are and so if somebody is just picking up uh you know, got a sky temp data set over, over this i want to invert it and you have a report that you'd actually know how to go all the way from your mathematical equations to the proper forward modeling of the sky cam data. Well, people don't always know that. That's that's why I'm saying that not only as it is, it's not enough to just be able to, to read what is written on the pages because you also have to know what you want to do with it. And a lot of people are not aware of just how important it is to model every single detail of the system. So yeah. It goes with the sky system, it goes with other systems yeah. too. But other contractors might do or uh, be more sort of heavy-handed on the data, meaning that they take some of that system response out of the data, or that's what they think they do, and deliver something which is supposed to be without a lot of system response effects. But uh, the question is whether they do that correctly. But why does the SkyCam uh, kind of get rid of the system response so that you have kind of an ideal waveform? Because it's a deconvolution and that's and that's it's numerically inherently unstable. Whereas if you model the system response and okay. all responses, yeah. it's numerically stable and you get exactly what you want. And that has been sort of a permeating philosophy which I have advocated always in this place here. So it has sort of it's all groups and environs, uh, that that's the way you model things. That's the way you do the conversion. You model the full system response on whatever system you use in the forward response because it's numerically stable to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Wish we'd have this conversation about 10 years ago. <laughs> hmm. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so that would, I think that would be good. Those would be two data sets that are of uh, interest and of historical background here, or maybe even present background, and uh, they bring into light 
a couple of really interesting things that we can look at at BC and yeah. just see what happens. Yeah, that'll be me. This one's yours? Yes. So what I do is... Oh. Yes. oh, yeah. You can flip the size with that and there's a... Right. So what I do is, is probably a, a peripheral to what most of you guys do, but hopefully you'll find it interesting anyway. Um, this is work I did in, in cooperation with Nicholas of Skytem, uh, among other people. So uh, <coughs> yesterday, Doc talked about um, natural source EM. Well, you also have these uh, BLF transmitters all around the world, transmitting really, really powerful uh, signals, mainly for military uh, use. Uh, and if you look at the noise spectrum, you'll see basically almost a flat spectrum, but you'll have these VLF signals coming in at, at fairly high power. And once you start uh, getting the data, uh, you're basically just applying low-pass filters. So in the early in the early gates, you'll have wide low-pass filters, which will basically incorporate all of this noise. So what do you do about it? You can try to, to filter it out, but that won't really work. Uh, as that was pointed out by McNay in the paper uh, from 2015. So if you try to filter it out, you might remove the effect of the radio signal, but then when you get a spherical, you'll get all sorts of crazy effects ringing and stuff that will really destroy your data. So you have to do something else. You have to to do a nonlinear removal of these signals to make it work. Luckily, um, as opposed to uh, natural sources, you have a very well-structured signal. You have, well, basically, in an, in an ideal world, you have two degrees of freedom. Uh, these are binary signals. You transmit uh, ones and zeros. So you, basically, you have that, and you have the amplitude. And well, then you have the phase as well but not a lot. So in the frequency domain, these uh, signals are uh, fairly narrow band, a few hundred hertz, and they die off fairly quickly. In the time domain, um, you transmit ones and zeros basically by switching the frequency of the signal. So you transmit that, it's a sketch, you transmit a high frequency for a, a, a one and a low frequency for a zero. So, sorry, can you, what is, that, what is MSK? Oh, yes. MSK is a form of coding for the signals. So we want to transmit binary information, ones and zeros. You want to transmit a one, you transmit one frequency. You want to transmit a zero, you transmit another frequency. So if you want to transmit one zero zero, you, you take your transmitter, send 100 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz, switch depending on the signal you want to transmit. Oh. And so just like, so, so yes. All the Transmitters are uh, sort of frequency modulated, just like in your FM station. At least more than fifty percent. Yes. Okay, this this okay. is they are MSK modulated or GMSK, which is basically a filtered variation where you get a lower bandwidth. Um, you get some other forms of modulation as well, but this is by far most common uh, because it's a very spectrally efficient way of doing it. Uh, and you can make low com uh, complexity receivers as well. So, so do they? Hold on. Uh, so you you've got a one and two zeros. So mm -hmm. your your one is uh, th your kilohertz, and your two your so, zero is two kilohertz. Do you, do you, do you do like a, a whole wavelength of um, that or like what? Usually, so so this is just a sketch. Usually, you have uh, uh, many oscillations, hundreds of oscillations within one symbol. So this would be, so so the red uh, curve represents ones, these are the simple times, and the green intervals represent zero. So this would be a one, one, zero, one, zero, zero. And the thing about MSK is that you, you ensure that the phase is continuous so you don't get phase jumps when switching to another frequency. So, so you get a, a, um, a narrow spectrum. I see. Uh, so, if you, if you didn't do that, this the, mm -hmm. this was basically low horrible and the signals would interfere with other people's signals. And uh, yeah, 
of course you don't want that. That would just ruin the game for everybody. So we have these signals and they actually contribute a, a significant amount of noise at early time gates. So what do you do about it? You have to some sort of, in, in some way, model these uh, signals and subtract them uh, in a nonlinear way. But of course, in reality, the signals don't look this nice. Um, if you're standing on the ground, you might get something that looks like this, plus some noise, plus a phase shift because of stuff that happens to the signal uh, <coughs> on the propagation path. The signal hits the uh, subsurface, you get a secondary response as well. You can actually in invert for this, and, uh, and that's called the VLF method. Basically the same as the natural source here, yeah, just using man-made natural sources. Um, but in TEM, you, you, in the most cases, just want to subtract this to get a, a, a cleaner uh, response. Uh, I think I know of one case where they actually tried to do a, a, a joint TEM VLF inversion. Uh, I don't actually remember how that went, but I've never seen it done <laughs> again. So, yeah. So what do you do? So, well, basically, you, you when you want to remove this radio signal, you want to receive a clean radio signal as much as possible. So from a radio reception point of view, you have a really good receiver. You have these reception uh, receiver coils. But then you have this TEM transmitter just hammering away on your radio signal uh, at 50 okay. times per second. So you want to somehow remove the effect of the TEM signal as much as possible. So, so what we do is, is we kind of try to, to, to fit the uh, primary field, which is uh, most of the, uh, the TEM signal that you measure, with a, uh, a polynomial and subtract it. So you kind of repair your, your signal. You still have secondary field effects, but we can mostly ignore these. Now, to, to get these radio signals, you have to, to sample at, say, at least five times the center frequency of the signal. So, or maybe 10 times uh, is more likely. So, so you have to, at least compared to what some systems do, sample at a fairly high rate. So that gives you a lot of data. If you want to reduce that, you can take the signal at somewhere in the frequency spectrum. You can do some uh, tricks, multiply with the complex exponential, and move it down to zero hertz. So now, instead of having a VLF signal at, say, 20 kilohertz, you move it down the spectrum, put it at zero hertz to get sort of a standard representation of the, of the signal. And you can sample it at a really low rate. So you, you try to isolate the signal. Um, then in many cases, you have several receivers. You have, an, uh, uh, for example, in the Skytem system, you typically have an, uh, an X receiver and a uh, Z receiver. So the VLF signal will be much more powerful in the, uh, in the X receiver. Uh, but it mainly gives you trouble in the set receiver because that's where you have most of your signal, uh, at least it often is. Yeah, excuse me, hold on. Yes. Uh, this business of shifting it down. So are you are you basically then just making use of aliasing here and then just resampling at bigger intervals no. so that things are just aliased back down? What, how, how do you, what are you doing? You can do some tricks with uh, aliasing, but you multiply with a complex exponential. Mm -hmm. Uh, which basically shifts all of your signals. So instead of a, a real sample representation of your signal, you get a complex representation centered around zero hertz. So, so you no longer have a, a, a symmetry around zero hertz in your spectrum, you get a complex signal centered around zero hertz. So you can multiply with a... With so a, you're rotating. Yes, you're basically rotating. So, so say you, you have a constant frequency. You can look at that as, as constantly rotating on the complex plane, right? Yeah. So if you want to make that zero hertz, oh, you I basically see. have to go the other way yeah. by multiplying with the complex exponential. Okay. So that's what you do. That's interesting. And, and so, yeah. so instead, instead of going around really, really fast, 
with small variations in the speed, you basically stand still and you have variations. Right? <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. So now we have, let's say we have two receivers, an X and a Z receiver, and we get, we get, we get the uh, inspiring signal on both, and we also have a, a, a geophysical signal on both receivers. Um, because the signal is way more powerful in the uh, in the X receiver, uh, it's a lot it's a lot easier to decode and remove. Uh, but still, we we do we do have some signal in the in the Z receiver, so we want to combine the signals from them to get as clean a radio signal as possible. So we combine these signals uh, using some uh, some tricks, looking at trying to figure out what's the amplitude of the radio signal on each receiver or actually the signal to noise ratio on the radio signal for each receiver. And then we have to try and estimate the signal parameters. So with these signals, you usually know, okay, we have say 200 symbols or, or bits per second, you know that, but you don't know the face of the signal. You don't know the amplitude of the signal. Uh, you might have simple time shifting, you might have frequencies shifting, because these are football field size transmitters where you actually have a, a, a variable um, inductor, where you have a, an engine physically moving on this variable inductor to switch the frequency. So you have a lot of uncertainties in these huge circuits. So you don't get ideal signals. And you want to correct for all these, estimate and correct for all these things that happen to the signal before you, you go in and decode it. Um, I won't get into the decoding. That uh, basically involves est taking the radio signal here and estimating the bit sequence from, from this noisy radio signal. So you get a, a stream of ones and zeros out. Great, if you, in, in, in most cases, from a, a radio reception perspective, you have, you have a sequence of ones and zeros, you have a, your information. But in our case, it gets much more complicated because we want to encode the signal again in the same way as was originally done uh, at the transmitter station. We want to split the signal and recreate the effect in each of the, uh, of the transmitters that we have of the radio signal and uh, uh, add all these non-ideal effects that we see uh, especially from if you have an app on TM system, moving around, moving, moving the coils, rotating in the field, gives you, uh, changes the reception parameters a lot. Um, for example, for, the, uh, for a, a set coil, say I have a set coil, my hand is a set coil, standing here, if uh, Nicholas is a transmitter, I'm pointing right at him, I have great reception. But when I rotate over here, I have zero reception. And because of the secondary field, the phase changes as well when you move around. So you get a lot of uh, effects that you want to estimate and, uh, and try to compensate. When you're happy with that, you up-convert the signal, you move it. Basically, so we stop the rotation in the complex plane, we reapply it, up-convert it from zero hertz to a uh, central frequency. And we now have a clean, representation of the radio signal, which we subtract from the original data, and hopefully we, uh, we get a better signal. Now, of course, so, so from a radio reception perspective, the TEM signal is, is bad for reception. But from a TEM perspective, the radio signal is the bad guy. So the criterion for success is that we shouldn't destroy the TEM signal. So I didn't have flight days available to test this, so I, I made these uh, fairly uh, crude uh, uh, setups to collect some data. First, I went around with a, a toad, toad wagon, tried to collect some two-component uh, noise data. It didn't work out very well. I got way too much uh, movement noise to get anything reasonable. Switched to a, a rotating platform two coils, an uh, X and a Z coil, and went out and, and measured some noise. And uh, then applied a uh, synthetic uh, TEM signal to this. Tried to, to sort of emulate flight data. 
uh, of course, there are some differences. For example, <clears throat> I would guess that the secondary field from the VLF signal is way more powerful in this situation than what you'd get in an F1 situation because you're closer. Also, these the positioning of these calls might not be very ideal if you have coupling between the two calls. But let's look at some results. So the blue curves are what we saw before. We have a, an a X receiver, a set receiver. So the blue is the noise spectrum before removal. And the orange signal is the noise spectrum after removal. And what you can't see here really on this receiver is the spectrum of the TEM signal. The T synthetic TEM signal was with a, uh, a 1 d uh, I think it was just a, a 50 ohm half space. And I added some some vibrations to the, the synthetic data. So you see a little bit of TEM. You can slightly see these lines here uh, from the TEM. In the set receiver, you, you see it much more. Um, and well, I tried to remove the uh, effect of the uh, radio signals. And you see, at least in the spectrum, it looks like they're pretty much gone. And, and this is the power spectrum. So this is really a large reduction. Now looking at uh, time domain results. This is the, the secondary field of the, uh, of the set receiver um, in the off time. And, and so what you see here, I don't know if you can see, there's a green dotted line here showing the uh, clean TEM response. Then we have the blue line that's before removal of the radio signal. And we have an orange line that's after. So what you see is that at, it might be a bit difficult to see here, but at early times and intermediate times, we actually get quite a lot of noise reduction. And then at late times, when our gates start to get uh, wide enough in time that they're really narrow in frequency so that the VLF signals are just filtered out, uh, you no longer really see the effect of the removal. You do just as well as you did before. Uh, looking at the difference here, you can see in the beginning we do well, and then we sort of draw off. Um, so yeah, here's another representation, the noise reduction factor. Um, for the X call, we have a really powerful interfering signal. Uh, so we get a noise reduction factor of about uh, about four here, approximately, and then we drop off to, to basically no no uh, improvement at, at later times. And in the other code, we have a reduction about approximately two, dropping off to about zero. Now, so the difficult part of this is actually, it's not difficult to decode the signals. What's difficult is to estimate all of these parameters. And at the present state, this is just done based on data. Uh, of course, when you fly around, you have all sorts of, of movement sensors. And incorporating measurements from those, I suspect, would make this a lot easier. Because basically, your reception parameters mainly depend on your orientation, depending on the, uh, on the Earth field and the uh, and the direction to the transmitter. So incorporating movement measurements, I, I think, would actually improve this, uh, improve this quite a bit as well. But I, I think uh, these, are, these are fairly good results still. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it will, it will give, give you some better data mm -hmm. at some point, at least. <laughs> So when you say you want additional data about how how the uh, what's the position of the transmitter and receiver and how it moves around, you uh, how closely do you need to sample that? I mean, the way it has it's been done at the moment is that sort of dense enough? Uh, I don't know how it's done at the moment actually, but so but there are in, in kilometers and um, compasses and GPSs and. Um, can very much sort of reconstruct the yes. movements of the whole system. Yes, and I think that's enough. So 
if you look in the frequency domain, you can kind of see here, we have the TEM frequency component as spectral lines and you have these signals coming in on top. So when you move around, you'll kind of move up and down, adding something, subtracting something from, from the TEM uh, signals. And, and right now, we can successfully remove these, uh, uh, the radio signals. Well, for one, because we, we can use the frequency information in between the TEM, but also because the variations are on a completely different time scale than the repetition frequency. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have, if, as long as you sample fast enough to capture the movements on the time scale that they happen, which I guess you do, because if you didn't, it wouldn't really make sense to measure anyway. Yes. Uh, I, I think you can actually help quite a lot. Right? Is that a problem that's been addressed by a yes. number of companies? Yeah, you know, I just hadn't, I don't know, so I just hadn't in, really thought about in, being. In, as being, in 2015, McNay published a paper addressing it, but he didn't really realize what would happen if you started moving around and took it airborne. And he, I think he didn't really properly understand the problem. Uh, he didn't understand how these signals worked. Mm -hmm. So, so he, he, he made something that worked on ground-based data uh, in, 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 you know, to a certain degree, yeah. but not all the way. He didn't include all the variables. Mm. That's very nice. And, you know, it's, so, so the VLF method is, you probably know way more about this, but it's it's an old method, right? Um, and it is used, but I think you just, I guess you just normally model it as a single frequency signal or, or just average over a long time, so, so you don't really care about the, the time variations. But I guess you could you could also, so, so we extract these VLF signals, I guess you could use that for interpretation as well if you want. Uh, I have no idea how much of that will give. Yeah, I mean, we always, yeah, you have VLF signal, it's coming in at some some particular frequency, that's yeah. what you use, right? Yeah. Um, so don't think about it being modulated. So, and the measure of the crime is very often sort of the ratio between the vertical and horizontal components, that's actually just what you have. Yeah, yeah. So it's, what you're saying is that the T M the airborne T M system is now also an airborne VLF system. Yeah, sure. <laughs> There's an your E field stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, but still you can get the yeah. I mean you can get that very short. And there's been a lot of focus in, in or so in, in T E M signal processing there's not a lot of focus on anything because there's not a lot of work happening. Uh, but there's been a lot of focus on uh, spherics. So trying to remove spherics using some fancy wavelet method. But the problem with spherics is you never know the shape of the spheric. Whereas here we have a, a signal with just a few degrees of freedom, and I think it makes mo and it's always there. Anywhere you go on Earth, you always have these powerful uh, transmitters. Uh, so I think it makes a lot of sense to try and handle this. Do you have any idea whether some of the tricks that are applied here would be applicable for spherics too? If you think about what you might do with spherics, so because it's a huge problem with you. So if you have on EM services, uh, there are seasons of problems in the tropics where it just can't fly. So that's a question of time scale. Um, so these are signals that are constantly there. Yeah. You model the variations on a large time scale. Yeah. So the the spherics are impulsive. Uh, with some sort of tail. And this tail might be affected by your movement and uh, vibrations and stuff like that. But it's it's difficult to handle. Maybe you could do some sort of remote reference uh, situation where you have the remote reference station and then your TEM signal and try to, to model the difference between the signal you receive uh, by looking at the motion of the, of the, the moving TEM system. It's certainly quite more complicated to treat this way. Very much more, and I, I think it's it's difficult to know what you get out of it, because basically what, what you do is, okay, I, I 
do a wavelet transformation, subtract something, does it look nice? Maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you, so you're saying in the tropics, there's like a couple months of the year that you just can't even fly? Is well, that bad? At any point in time, there's somewhere between 100 and 500 lightning strikes per second. And these traveling around in the, in the, uh, in the cavity that you yeah. talked about yesterday between the Earth and the ionosphere. And meaning that they are pretty much, you, you find them everywhere in any, any, at any point in time. But um, in the nighttime and um, in the winter hemisphere, there we are in the summer hemisphere and in the daytime, the stronger, of course. So the closer you are to the, to the tropical thunderstorms that are the main contributor to this, the closer you are to them, the more, I mean, the worse the problem. Yeah. And there is definitely a season in Australia where you just can't fly in the morning territory. You might as well not do it because it's, it's too, too much fairness. It destroys any kind of airborne system. These data were actually recorded uh, with a thunderstorm rolling in, and I could s just see them on uh, oh, yeah. in, in the data. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's thank you. So I guess uh, that was a, yeah, couple, totally. a couple of lightning strikes per second, maybe up to five or something. Oh. Well, you were saying a hundred. Yes, at any point in time, there are between 100 and 500 lightning strikes over the planet. Yeah. It's an interesting number. You can actually hear them. Pardon me? You can hear them. Hear them. Yeah, you put on your headphones, everybody has headphones. You go out and you uh, take one of them to an electrode you put into the ground somewhere, and another electrode you put 10 meters away. You listen to a 10 meter grounded iPhone in your experience. Whoa! That's opens up a whole new segment of our life. Like, like, <laughs> what, what are we going to drink and smoke? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's go listen to the spirits. This could be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. uh, just, I got to come back to Denmark more often. <laughs> When we did the AC electrical system in the nine, beginning of the 1980s, which was actually a grounded uh, frequency domain dipole system, because you talked about it yesterday that nobody had really done much about that. We actually did it in the 80s. Yeah. Okay. We sort of put out a, a easy smiles and sort of, sort of as I mean, you probably did. I haven't seen it live, I've only seen pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of data because it's never worked. Anyway, we put out this um, 10 meter dipole, grounded, very well grounded, hollow steel thing that we hammered down and then we put salt water into it, sitting out through holes so you really get a good contact so that you can transmit as much current as you as you possibly could. Then you transmitted your signal there. And we ended up using um, the dipole pole kind of method with what the one stationary potential level points away. And then there was a movable potential level source which then was sort of walking out from in here pom 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 further yeah. further and further up just like when you do some BJ sign. Yeah. And we transmitted um, four or five different frequencies. Started around 100 hertz because then we were out of IP effects pretty much. Uh, and then took it up to 10 kilohertz. We very often didn't use that one. The best signals were 2 kilohertz and 5 kilohertz. They were the most amazing things. And we called uh, the so, you know, the amplitude and only the amplitude. We it because uh, it was one of the first attempts to actually solve the equivalence problem that you had with geological measurements, you know, the high resistivity. And more and more people wanted to look at um, 
both the universal materials like sand, gravel, and stuff like that. You never know. You never know how much there was of it because of that equivalence. You know, it could be you know, very high resistivity and much thinner and different. On that. And also concerning the water situation, you know, again, you would sort of you'd really like to know when you hit the, the groundwater table, but that was subject to the high resistivity equivalent of the dry. Sand. There's a lot of focus on that, and. And we knew that, you know, if you have a combination of inductive and galvanic methods, you can sort of resolve that kind of equivalences. And so we devised the system and used it, and it had its time, and we had it out of the inversion program for it and all that. And uh, we actually resolved it. And for the first time, we could also include our coefficient of anisotropy in our inversions, because now we had both Galvanic measurements and and inductive measurements, mm -hmm. so we actually had to do that. So the issue of uh, an asymmetry sort of suddenly also bloomed up because suddenly we could see it in the and in the red book. Oh, nice! Did you ever write that up? Yes, but not uh, not really, not really to the point of being sort of a really big polished um, journal paper. That other, it came out in, in, in little sort of spurts and squirts here and there and conference proceedings. Okay. So what year was it? Well, what, uh, it was done in the early 80s, say between, the system was functioning in 83, 84. Yeah. I had a year of going round to the different counties in Denmark <coughs> doing, doing this type of measurements and converting it and to try and see how how much more you would get out of that kind of data compared with traditional theoretical science. Yeah. That was three to eighty-four. Okay. Oh. Nice. So, maybe we're, so were you the first and the last person in Denmark to do grounded source? Uh, yes, you can say that, yeah. I, me and whoever else, uh, I mean, the other people who were involved. In and I mean, there were some students doing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Coming to a website near you. <laughs> the first and last person to do grounded source EM in Denmark. <laughs> In 1987, I went to the uh, University of California in Berkeley for uh, four months to, you know, do a bit of research and see what people were doing there, trying to learn and absorb as many things as they possibly could. And I was presented with the transient system. And I just, somehow I thought that was, that was really cool, you know. By just putting out 40 by 40 meter in the field, you can look at 20 meters into the ground. It was amazing. Instead of having all these long electrodes and stuff, it, it was quite cumbersome. It, I mean, that's what really killed it. It was quite cumbersome to set up all this, uh, to do these AC geological sounds. If you, call them. Um, if, you did, if you did DC, you could do six, maybe eight, and you could do one summer day, a day or a team of three people, but here you could do only half of that. Also took uh, more time to measure yeah. all the frequencies. So I ran into the transient system. I found out that that was just really cool. I tried to get the money to buy it, and in 1991, I think it was, we sort of piggybacked on a project from the Danish Technical University from deep groundwater resources. I was I was too young an associate professor to be trusted the means from the state. So that's why I was thinking we pick it back on, on one of the projects. And we got the chance. It just blew away any kind of thought about using you know the frequency domain pandemic system. Because you with the transient system you can do 20 soundings a day, 16, 20 soundings a day. Two people. But really it's just so much higher. And meaning also that then one of the concepts which has been sort of 
a key concept for whatever we did here in Denmark was that measure densely, measure all large areas. If you do that, you get so much more information than just from the yeah. and here and there. And that's what we started to do with the transition system. It had only been here for about a year, then it was never in the ship. Always out. Measuring. Students measuring for Orange County, some of the other counties. And it kind of exploded. I mean, that, that's one of the things I think is really remarkable about Denmark, just all of the geophysical data that you've taken, either with, you know, the DC resistivity or with, uh, you know, inductive time domain systems, right? I don't think there's any other country that's been, had such a high percentage of its area covered with geophysical data. Well, that was, I mean, the fact that you could do all these measurements and the fact that you got so much information out of actually doing it, and the fact that there were people in Northern County who were willing to take the risks and collaborate with us, mm -hmm. and who would also see the value of it, and who would promote it sort of in the administrative world, the political world. All that contributed to the fact that then we started the groundwork of the day. It's huge. It's because we showed, what we showed was that it was possible to be done. We had the methods to actually map all the, sort of, the whole important part of all the important uh, aquifers in Denmark could be mapped to physically. And that you can get a lot of good information out there for building hydrogeological models in such a way that you can take care of the groundwater resources and sustain them. But was uh, taking care of groundwater resources in a sustainable way, was that, was, was that kind of uh, something that was in the public's eye, the politician's eye back, you know, 30 to 25 years ago? in Denmark to, to actually just pump the water out of the ground and use it, pretty much. I mean, it's aerated so that you get some of the iron out. Um, but uh, apart from that, uh, it's been the way that you have done it in Denmark for a long, long, long time. You just pump up the groundwater and the ground was fine. You can get untreated. And it's, it's, some, it's such a societal value. It's really, I mean, if you compare with other countries, it almost, I mean, it's not the situation almost anywhere. Mm. So but still, there's been quite, there's been quite a keen interest in keeping it this way mm. because it is absurd. But sometimes people don't appreciate that there's an interest in keeping it until there's some kind of a catastrophe. So, so long as, you know, everything is going on swimmingly, like, okay, why should we care about that? It's going to be... You know, and the catastrophe is all, uh, of course, happened. First one was nitrates. Nitrate and dry water from excess fertilizer. And the next one was pesticides. So that's what we're kind of back in. But were, were those evident before everybody brought, kind of got on board with respect to having large scale mapping of uh, groundwater? Yes, to a certain extent, but also. I mean, the importance of it also dawned more and more on people because, because this whole method of sound. Mm -hmm. But we also have, uh, let's say, a vulnerable water distribution system because it's very distributed. That means that every small village has its own wells and water work. And so that means that we have to keep it because there's a lot of small water works. They can't afford to be cleaning the water. So that's cause of kind of forced policy that we yeah. want to keep keep the groundwater clean enough to to not clean it. Mm. <laughs> Otherwise we have to rethink the whole way that we distribute our water. Well, I guess that's what some other com countries are coming, trying to come to grips with. California, I think, is probably especially true in this regard, right? You could all these different water districts, and but yet, you know, they're all connected at depth, and so you can't just have a vertical uh, wall saying, "Okay, this is this is mine. I can, you know, get whatever I want here." And the it's problem is neighbors. that some people consider it as being mine. I mean, it's 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 a commercial thing. 
here in Denmark, a lot of waterworks were either run by the municipality or they were run by uh, Endelsfri, which is a sort of a people grouping together to form a waterworks for this kind of town or this village. It's, it's, it's a long, long tradition of, you could say, um, popular organization in Denmark, mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of things are organized that way. Starting with some of the really small farmers, they're saying, why should we sell the, the, the milk to, to the big farmers for not enough money when we can build our own dairy? And they build their own dairies. Like 40 small farmers when yeah. there and all that. So there's a long tradition in, in any kind of field in Denmark to organize things that way. And a lot of the water which were actually also organized that way. So there's this, there's, a, this, uh, there's this sort of common feeling in Denmark that water is not owned by anyone, but it's, it's a common good. And that you only get problems out of making it, uh, privatizing it, mm -hmm. always proved beyond any kind of doubt from a lot of other situations in the world. Yeah. Well, maybe some of that historical base is, is kind of the prelude to why, I mean, you're basically a social democratic country. Yeah. And, you know, you compare that with you know, places like the United States, for instance, yeah. Canada to some extent too, right? And just entirely different mentalities on how you perceive yourself in, in a world interacting with other people, whether it's me first and me only, or whether you're actually, you know, wanting to make Never sure that everybody us. is up to us. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Wow. I appreciate those guys. And the fact that the first guy to do the crowd is so <laughs> yeah. I just, I am, you have no idea how impressed I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do we have, was there anybody else to present? Yeah. It's a small one. Well, we always save, save the best to last. <laughs> I don't know. We're at least. You can say that now we are moving into some entirely different world away from the academic uh, and scientific yeah. oh. kind of private sector. <laughs> yeah. so, so we are from uh, okay. The same. Yeah. So we are from Kobe, which is an engineering company with around six thousand employees. Some engineers within all kinds of different engineering disciplines. Our department is only thirty people out of all these, and uh, we have approximately 15 geophysicists, geologists. In our world, uh, academic does not take us the the first place. What we, our main focus is, is always the client. So we have our core lives centered around those clients. So it's always a matter of how much value can we provide our clients, and of course, that requires us to choose the right methods, but also to do things within a short time frame, because otherwise it will be too expensive. So it's always a cost-benefit analysis for the clients, and to us it's always interesting to know new ways of applying methods, because potentially open new markets and yeah, find new clients. So what we are showing here is just one slide for each case. So we have four cases. We won't go into detail. No, just okay. yes. <laughs> okay, so yes have this. Did you want to? Yeah, maybe. So we'll just show those four cases to tell a little bit about what we're doing. So, yeah. pointing. <laughs> wow, what a team! I love it. <laughs> <laughs> one's got the slide changer. One's got the pointer. Everyone's keeping it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is good. So, this is just the. A case where we had a railway, it's uh, going to be electrified, they're going to add extra tracks. So you can maybe you can see a cable line here, red one. So that's where we have our easy measurement carried out, quite close. And uh, what we're looking for here is to avoid a risk for our client. So our client is, they are um, in Denmark, the railway companies, they, they are trying to avoid soft soils. So our task was to figure out 
do we have soft soils where the new tracks are planned? And we have this cable right here measuring for large distance. And then one of the profiles came out here. We had some balls to correlate with. And what they were looking for is this soft soil we see here, the low risk security. Actually, we were lucky in this place to have, <laughs> they were doing a lot of geotechnical measurements, so we could compare and see that it fits very well with what they see from the geotechnical measurements. So, yeah, at least they, now they know how much to dig away and to replace by some higher strength material before they did this extra drive. Real world is also cables in the ground, so of course we we have to mask some areas where we can't see anything due to the, those cables. But that's our first case. I think the the tool so it was kind of 25 kilometers along yeah. existing tracks. Mm -hmm. and I think it was almost all of the Fetsta Islands. Yeah. Yeah. And due to safety reasons, of course, they had to keep some distance from tracks. So some places they were really between trees and bushes and oh well, yeah, it was a little bit messy. Oh, you mean to actually collect the data? Yes. Yeah. We had a really nice 12 feet crew. <laughs> oh. So, so how, how close could you come to the tracks? I think there was a, a safety zone of five meters. Yeah. Five meters? Yes. Mm -hmm. Pretty exciting. Yeah, the train's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then... <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, yeah. Did you have any effect from uh, the tracks themselves? Uh, not really, but we could see uh, some they have this, uh, there was some kind of uh, small uh, yeah, sheds right, where you could see that there was some kind of electrical installations in them mm. where you could see that you got really... Around, for instance, where you have the signals or what? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and in some places they also tried to, when population was higher, they would shield the tracks and then you would have some fences that you would yeah, mm -hmm. destroy yeah. your data. Yeah. So, but, that's, but there was really, it was open yeah. land, right, on Felster, there are a lot of... Uh, yeah, agricultural fields. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So what spacing were these spaces collected? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. But you're, I mean, your tracks are on railroad yeah, they, they ties, are, are, right? Yeah, it's yeah, on gravel, elevated, yes. so you're yeah. probably pretty much, if you had an active source, yeah. EM source, mm -hmm. you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So, no, but that was, uh, sorry, I don't think you said it was DC resistivity. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh, we do that a lot. <laughs> So. No, but here's the case where, I mean, if if you're going to do an EM experiment, those yeah. tracks wow. would yeah. probably be a lot more problematic. Right? <laughs> so here, here's the case where the, you know, the DC actually has got a benefit over the EM. But aren't the tracks, we're just discussing here, if, if the tracks are grounded, like, aren't, aren't they? Wouldn't they? Uh, I don't think because if it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, this section is not electrified, it's just uh, no, no, going no, no, no. But they're the same time? In Canada, they they build a track, but they've got all these railroad ties, right? So that's wood, yeah, and that's yeah. sitting on gravel. A track, but wood 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 still ground ground the, the tracks themselves, just if, in case of lightning and stuff. You want oh, things to be. I think maybe that was what know. we saw, kind of on a yeah. different part of it. These little sheds, kind of they they ground every place. Yeah, I've never thought about that. Maybe on purpose ground. No, yeah. Yeah. The spikes or anything. But yeah. 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 Kind of the survey we did in uh, a project where we're going to make a horizontal direction run because uh, there's a river um, mm -hmm. and the river is part of a bigger kind of wetland area that they were not allowed to kind of uh, flow in the, in the cables oh. so uh, so we need we needed to kind of uh, yeah and, um, <coughs> to map the geology so they could kind of make a risk assessment on it. It was supposed to be that um, so uh, they were done, I think, one or oh, three, three lines kind of crossing the river and also the wetland, uh, and then I think one pair of so it's so, uh, and I've also done, done some drillings, um, so, so we have some, uh, I think actually some subsoil on the top, uh, yeah, good shit. 
in the, in the, the green. Red. Yellow yeah. one. Then we have some uh, some melt water sand, the red one, and then some uh, this nickel clay and sand below. So, yeah. And the red one here down here, that's kind of uh, the, where the horizontal direction drilling is supposed to be. And so they have all this specification on the uh, kind of uh, entry and exit angle of this here, and also how far below do they want to be from the, from the surface. Yeah. So, so. So, so what is your system? Is it just just a whole bunch of electrodes? No, that's, a, that's also met. Oh, sorry, uh, the DC resistivity measurement. Right, but do you have a whole bunch of electrodes and you're firing some up as currents and yes. others as potential? Yeah, yeah, we do it with the gradient array setup. Oh, so you're... We have, I think, uh, there was uh, so 800 meters, and then it's just, uh, this is just part of it crossing the river. Okay, so, so this you... here is just this little part here, where we have the electrodes in the oh, river, I and see. then we kind of extend on both sides. Okay. So you just used the cables, you didn't yes. need to no, no, no. Yeah. Because you use the little sort of... Yes, the connector. Yeah, they all open cables. Yeah. 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 So, so you just have them in the water and then they will be connected. Okay. Yeah. But you need to keep them flowing. flowing yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you'll have to work with buried electrons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you must be a pro. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you saw the <laughs> river sort of, right? We had... <laughs> Hundreds of floating electrodes that were taped onto the wire cable <laughs> with uh, the yeah, needle and bottles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and bottles. Uh, yeah. Location here we have this uh, aggregate mapping, so we're looking for gravel and sands for construction purposes. And here we see uh, the topography shown as well because it correlates well with the high topography. You see you have it is sand and gravel. I think it's yeah, a, yeah, yeah, I think this, I think this, uh, this is a kind of a <laughs> the, slice with the, this, uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, this slice with, yeah. Oh, yeah, what is it, five meters or something like that? Yes, I think it's two yeah. to five meters below surface. Yes. Uh, and then it's the uh, average uh, resistivity for, for that section. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. But then, uh, so. yeah, no, but yeah, it was, yeah, but in, in the lines, right? Yeah. yeah. The color scale is slightly different from what we usually apply, but that's the, yeah. At least the purple one represents the sandy gravel. And so, what were they? They're going to mine that? Are they going to use this? Uh, I don't know. No, no, we don't know. It's, it's they are allowed then. It's, it's a mapping that was requested by. We think it was the one of Danish regions yes. saying that they are they have kind of yeah. uh, what do you call it? Uh, identified different areas where they think there will be potential yeah. interest for these aggregates. Yeah. Uh, but actually, no one has the right then to mine it, so it's uh, that the owners of those areas they can then apply to be allowed to extract it. Yeah. So it's but it's nice. the same again. Mm -hmm. yeah. The state owns. Yeah. The resource. Water, water, water resource. <laughs> yeah. So even though you own the land, you need to apply for a permit to extract or to mine. Yeah. Well, so the regions they will they will request mapping from the consulting companies, and then make decisions based on that where to assign you raw material. Okay. They can okay. Just, just and they have to renew yeah. the Sorry. permits also. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Just, just a clarifying question for those uh, profiles: there is there a water table in there? Or is it, no, no. Is this only the differences in resistivity is that only uh, from? Oh, I, I think uh, yeah, yeah. I I can't really remember. Uh, but what we have is that at least yeah now it coincides with the top chalk. I'm not really sure about the where the brown water level is oh, okay. uh, in that place. Okay. Uh, it doesn't seem to be mapped in the bottom. No, so no. But, yeah, of course we have a. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong one. We have this uh, soda section up here yeah. with the apparent resistances, and then the 2D model and the 1D LCI yeah. made with the software. Yeah, from yeah. yeah. here, developed here. So, and then the last one that was uh, mapping we did in in Sweden, where the, the top one is also a DC resistivity measurements, and then we also used the Q radar. Um, we saw some really quite different resistances than in Denmark. <laughs> yeah, to kind of uh, 
just to we don't have that much hard rock in Denmark. No, so hard rock. <laughs> hard rock, yeah. Um, but yeah, there was a really nice yeah. match also with the where you see where the curator signal dies here was corresponding to where we also saw some really really low visitors. Okay. Um, so there's definitely something that is massive. Yeah. The use a uh, curator signal. So so there are some kind of small examples of, of what we actually do so with the that, different methods. So what are we looking at in the bottom one? That's so just the combination. Just yeah, so you got the uh, georadar over the top. Over the, yeah, so you have that six, six. layer there which correlates with that surface. If you it was actually so an area where we are not allowed to make any balls uh, mm. because it was, I think it was a protected area for, for, for water uh, resources. Uh, so they were not allowed to bring in some drilling rigs and stuff like that. So. But, uh, Just so in the in the top one, so when you get into the purple, so that's really resistant? Yeah, it, 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 all of it is actually really resistant compared to when you look at the Danish kind of geology. So this is probably a bit for different degrees of uh, yeah. Okay. And then on, on the I'm not the, the, so I don't know. The what left hand it, side where you've got this great big thing coming in at the bottom. Is that something that sorry? Oh, yeah. this guy here. Yeah. Uh, the, I did I think I think I forgot to put a color scale on, but I think we are above I think five hundred hundred ohmmeters for everything unless the blue that is uh, I think twenty or something. So it's a lot it's it's high resistive. All of it, almost. Oh. Except for this little right corner. So, so do, you, do you do a lot of uh, georadar work? And we have some colleagues in Lumpy yeah. doing And we do it more and more compared yeah. to the, the past where we didn't do that much. But mm -hmm. it's kind of the, it's, it seems like the. When was it? Five, it was two years ago, maybe. Uh, but it's uh, we use it more and more, and that's for both uh, this uh, this la uh, this uh, drainage surface water drainage mapping, and also for kind of uh, wire localization mm -hmm. and stuff, mm -hmm. okay. and really structures as well. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, look. <laughs> Okay, that was, was that yeah. So maybe we should take a short break, stretch your legs, and then. I have, we'll... a question for you, right? Otherwise yeah. I have a question for you. Among all the various definitions of depth of investigation, which one is your favorite? <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not sure that we actually have the definition. Some of the things some of for, so, for for <laughs> some for, for some problems that we've done, um, I guess we we either use two. We either use uh, something that's sensitivity based, which is not so different perhaps from what's here, and the other is we'll like actually do two inversions uh, with. Different backgrounds. You know. uh, they have their pros and cons, but both of them you know, kind of tend to give you something that's reasonably similar. I think the main thing with those depth of investigation is to do something that is sensible and cut off you know, pieces that you know you you know should not be there. Because the moment that you show that picture with something out there to somebody who doesn't know what's going on, you say, oh, don't look at that. Well, it's too late. You do, they can't get it out of their minds. And yourself? Um, I, I agree with you in your hesitation, because uh, who, who could say that any of the DOI sort of definitions would be a favorite? And particularly for one reason, which is my next question, that is, both the one where you use two different start, starting models for the inversion background models, 
um, you would have to say, well, um, investigation is where they differ a certain amount. You have to put in a number. And the same is with these sensitivities. Yeah. You have to put in a limiting value somewhere. So my next question is, did you ever come across the depth of, in, uh, of investigation definition and an algorithm how to find it that did not require an ad hoc user defined constant? No, not really. No. You know, I, I mean, there is no such thing as really <laughs> depth. I mean, everything is graded, right? You're always exactly. seeing down exactly. to That's some. You're I, just seeing less, you know, less and less exactly. and less. So you, you have to have some kind of a metric that does a first pass and say, okay, that's that's kind of about where I'm yeah. seeing. But, and then you can be more cautious, or less, depending on what you want. Now can we have coffee? <laughs> and then we'll come back and Li Lindsay will take you through some of the stuff in, in Simpact, show you our, about our open source resources. And hopefully this will also be a motivation for people to contribute. There's there's quite a this group especially has got a there's a lot of opportunity. You know, people have stuff, they're you know, and if we could somehow capture that and kind of get working together. We, we could develop some really, really great resources that would be of so much use to many people out there. And I think we could do something along that. That'd very, be great. It's very powerful pedagogy. Very powerful. Great admirer of what you're doing. Well, we have a really good team. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> and you have to sort of put it down as a tradition. This is what we do here. So since you're here, um, I think you should contribute to it. Good. And since we're here, I think you should contribute to it. <laughs> this is great. I wish I had said that. Teed it up. That's only for uh, that's only for your uh, 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 we will put it on the web yeah. if everybody's <laughs> in, but if not then we'll yeah. 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 because the slides yeah. I guess all the hidden ones if you can yeah, we'll just have to throw it away. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, do you go in and you can put this on the There you go. Um, what we'll do is I can put them all to PDF, yeah. and then we'll remove any of the slides. And then I'll send you a link to before we put it live, and then if there's anything you want to address it. No, I guess the conclusion should probably also go away. Okay, yeah, sure. So that was for the whole talk that I kind of. What I'll do is, um, all I'm going to do is put like a to-do note for myself, so we will remove, and, and so I'll do that before we, before we have yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your presentation, very much appreciated. <laughs> Um, yeah.
I compared sort of uh, uh, that was what I was you need to assume something about models, you choose a model and then you can how it can determine the model for this case. And if I'm very just a very
I should actually connect my own computer because then we would have a whole picture. Ah, I think it is. <laughs> okay, guys. I stole five minutes, kicked off, seven. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. introduced the first TM system in Denmark, so I thought we should just have a look at the latest <laughs> as well. It'll just be five minutes, so I'll just uh, talk, present the the TTEM system, so it, it should of course have been Esther because he's much more uh, directly involved in, in the development here than I am, but, but I'll just present it. So this picture is from two, three weeks ago. Anyone here? No, no, exactly. There was, a, there was a storm and it was raining like hell and we were uh, out there actually getting close to stakeholders and end users and showing them what geophysics can do, talking to the farmers, so there's farmers and there is a uh, agricultural scientists and economical scientists and there's all kinds of people here so this is really using geophysics in the real world and estimates here talking about the instrument <laughs> um, so uh, yeah let's not discuss too much of that so the TSIM system is uh, being developed because we saw that there was a gap in the current systems today where if you want to do big coverage I mean, big areas. So you can either go sky tent, then you go deep, and you have fairly big footprints. So you also have some lateral smearing in the in the shallow parts, and there's also sort of a minimum uh, thickness that you need to have to be able to see it in the shallow parts. Of course, you can do DC, but you're never going to map thousand thousand acres uh, or hectare with with uh, DC. That's just just going to take you too long. So we we thought uh, that there was uh, a gap. For an instrument that could go for the top 30 meters 
in a in a in a reasonable fast acquisition. And the backdrop for this is uh, nitrate retention mapping in in Denmark. This is where where sort of a lot of the money at least is coming from. So the basic idea is that you take a virgin land where you don't know much, and then you go and map, and then you conceptualize or you you get the flow paths of of your waters, and then you you can colorize your fields where they are vulnerable or more robust to to possible nitrate uh, leaching uh, into into surface waters and, and ground waters. Um, yeah, so this we don't need to talk about. It's a TM system. The receiver is out here, towed in the back, and the transmitter is here, and you can see all the wiring going in a very specific way, and the instruments are sitting sitting up here in the back of the, uh, of the ATV, and there will be GPS sitting mm -hmm. here, and in one of the towers here, now I don't, I'm front. not, the front one? Oh, this one is Okay. Yeah, but there's a white dot on both of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's one of them. Let's just. Sorry. Is that a three-component receiver? No, it's a one-component. Okay. It's it's just because it, that's, that's just the looks of it. it. The receiver sits down here, okay. suspended, so that it's it's it, it vibrates as this little. Oh. Um, yeah. So this is a movie. What will that? Can you? Play. Oh, so this is a deep driving wow, up and down. Hard. So this is, I guess, <laughs> twenty kilometers per hour or something, maybe less here. But this is this is you, you can't go 15, 20 kilometers per hour. This would be the operating speed that you would be going at. And at that speed, we acquire one stacked sounding every one meter or so. But afterwards. Uh, averaging it down a little bit because just the data amounts will be massive. Um, so we go up and down in spraying tracks. Uh, so that would be all, and also in between spraying tracks. So so maximum 50 meters between or 20 meters between lines, and then you get say five or 10 meters between soundings along the line, and then you just drive up and down. Um, yeah. So this is for the. Maybe not so much for you, but for people that don't know anything about geophysics, this is a nice little cartoon showing what we do. <laughs> Black dots would be the DOI, and then we sort of map the, the geology as we go along. Yep. Done. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> uh, I have some slides, so about the instrumentation and why all the wiring is exactly as it is here. And, and the, the take-home message is here that there's been done so much experimentation about where are the GPSs, where should they be, where should the different instruments be, what are the distances between the different components, and where should the wiring be. So basically, bottom line is that nothing is, um, uh, I mean, everything is on purpose exactly where it is <laughs> by experiment. Nothing is um, by coincidence in, in any particular spot. So these are just images of all the different tests. You can see here, a, in, a, in an earlier stage, we wanted to do a sort of a null coupled system like Skyten with with the receiver sitting on the on a on the back of the of the transmitter, uh, but that turned out to be a no go for some reasons. Um, but basically, lots of different experiments with having the wiring going in different ways, and yeah. So mm. the result that we have here is not uh, is is. is it's the result of lots and lots and lots of experiments. Um, yeah, it just keeps on going. So these these were just in, uh, pictures of the of the logbook where all, where all these different experiments were were tracked down. So just one example here is um, is showing one of the one of the issues that turned out. So this is the uh, temperature of the transmitter shown here, and what you see in some places here, if you look carefully. This is testing different offsets, but you will see that there is actually a mimic of the temperature into the, into the data collected. That turns out to be problematic. So for one thing, you need a very, very accurate temperature regulation system in the transmitter. Because otherwise, you'll, you'll be able to see. Well, the what's the scale on that temperature? I have no idea. <laughs> you need to ask it. It's not much. Some, some, a few degrees, probably. But at least the regulation is, is accurate down to 
The reason why it affects the current that is transmitted, yeah. etc. Yeah. So these are the specifications that that are that are that we are ending up uh, in the end. Uh, so constant temperature and constant input voltage. We have it's again it's a two moment system like Skyten, right? So it's a 30 ampere high moment at uh, 800 hertz repetition and two and a half ampere low moment at 2100 hertz repetition. Um, yeah, low pass filters and seven meter offset between transmitter and receiver. So not six and not eight, but seven. <laughs> yeah. So how, how do you alternate between at the high moment and the, the low moment? It just yeah, that's that's a uh, programmable. We, you you can do it at any <coughs> how you want. You can, you can have many lows if you want, particularly the very shallow parts, or you can have low high, low high, low high, and then stack it up, or you can do. Anything you like, basically. So we looked at uh, some sensitivity studies. Uh, so these would resonate with what you showed yesterday. Uh, so these are just uh, sensitivity functions uh, for, I think this is a TDM system, but this was actually just conceptually. But what I wanted to show is this one, where we compared. So basically, one of the ideas here is that we want a footprint laterally. This was one of the arguments for not doing Skyton here that is smaller than what you can get with Skyton. So these are sensitivity functions um, of a Skyton system at five microseconds. And, and these are 2D sensitivities. So it's the 3D sensitivity distribution collapsed into, into the one dimension. Um, and then we have the T10 sensitivity distribution. And uh, just for comparison, a dual EM with uh, four um, four lengths in it, uh, so the frequency domain system, which is very, very shallow. And then we see the t term and the sky term seem to have sort of the same depth at, at, at five microseconds, but especially laterally, the t term system is much, mm -hmm. much narrower. Um, and these are just normalized individually, these, these images. So it's a little bit difficult to compare actually also the depth, because it, it might be that there is actually much, much higher sensitivities up here. So it's a, but just at least as a, as a first shot visually, you can see that, that the T-TIM is, is much narrower. And what comes on top of this is actually the lateral averaging when you start flying. So the flying speed and stacking time is not included here. And that would have a, probably a little bit bigger effect here than here because the speed here is much larger. So you need to smooth it a little bit more. This is static, <coughs> just assuming you're standing still with the sky system. Okay, so I just want to show you briefly uh, what was collected uh, during the last two weeks. We have a field area just outside Aarhus. Aarhus is just uh, here, and the field area is just a little bit west of us. So agricultural land, and uh, it looks like this with the different farms and the different owners. The red areas we can't go, and the green areas are where we're going to map. So this is a 1,000 hectares, uh, so it's a fairly big 10, 10 square kilometers, right? So it's a fairly big area. Uh, to map if you wanted to do it in any any non-continuous way. So these are the mapped uh, fields at this point. Some of the green areas have not been mapped yet because we're waiting for uh, the crops to be finally out so that we can access the fields. And you can see each of the lines are basically the, the, uh, the vehicle going up and down. And if we just look at one profile, this is, this is what you get. So southeast to the northwest, we have a profile here. So this is just 1.3 kilometers, so it's a very, very short profile, actually. And what we see, and what we haven't seen, and probably wouldn't see in, with Skytem either, is that we have these very nicely uh, delineated structures that are, appears to be, we don't know yet, we don't have any drillings, but it appears to be some sort of thrusting with ice, uh, glacial tectonics, that mm -hmm. basically uh, over pushes uh, clays from this lower line clay, basically <coughs> lenses are being pulled up and, and shot over <coughs> by the ice. This is at least the first initial interpretation somehow. And also, it's possible actually to identify within just 40 meters or so individual clay lenses of, of parts of this clay layer that has more clay, and then just next to it there's less clay. And interconnections maybe between the upper surface and down to this deeper aquifer and so on. Mm -hmm. so that's, a lot of detail. And if we just take across, so all these data have been inverted just 
individually along lines, so there's no uh, spatial constraints. Uh, but if we just take all these four profiles, we can actually see that many of the structures you can follow mm. from line to line. Maybe that is then, I don't know, this period, and then this one is that one, I don't know. But, so it seems that there is a lot of uh, consistency in the, in the data that we're collecting at this point. Yeah, the data have been cropped out here, but there is a road. <clears throat> that was wow. it. That was That's great. Fairly fast. Well, how exciting. <laughs> Yep. At least the results got us excited. Yeah. Yeah, they they look very oh, is promising. Quick. Yeah, very oh, nice. High resolution images. Same things. Yep. Seem to have a geologic texture to them. And this this was really the first trial of this in no, the field the, Well, not trial, the first survey. First survey? <laughs> <laughs> ah, <yes. laughs> At this point. <laughs> When, without going to, I know, I know that you plan to do three inversion of this, of course. But without going to that, you can say, first of all, we do sort of um, normal LCI inversion on the lines, and then do a sort of in, in a staged appro approach, and then you can use the neighboring, the neighboring models that you find as constraints in a new goal. I, uh, sorry, was there a question? I don't know. I... No, it, it, it's. I mean, it's a suggestion of what is possible to do, and did you consider doing that? Yes, LCI, I guess. So. so this this was LCIs. Yes. So yeah. you have all the LCIs. We're going to do SCIs, but so yeah. but yeah, the final data quality control has not been done here. That will be done based on the LCIs, and then we'll yeah. go back to the data, yeah. finally polish them, and then the SCI will be carried out. Yes. Sure. What what was the last acronym? SCI, so Which spatially constrained, where you yeah, so where you add, you don't have lateral. You, you also connect to neighboring line. lines across, so not just oh, a line, line where you're I driving, see. but also to your neighboring yeah. uh, profile. In a, it's it's a Delon triangulation that sets up all these yeah. Voronoi triangles. Yeah. Nice. Well, that's exciting. Well, you guys are just blasting forth here. Because you got new you know, airboard system, this. Yep. Anas, um, we talked about this before, but I mean, I'd like to have a look at this. Um, the fact that you have a separated transmitter in the CO also means that uh, if you're on high conductive ground, you'll get negative down. And then it will be science shift. Mm -hmm. and, um, and because it's such an early time system, you will probably also see that time shift oscillation. Yeah. Um, and you still, uh, what you do is just you sort of push away those data and sort of yet to be seen. We haven't seen the, the negative data yet. Okay. But I mean, once we see them, we will need to have discussions on what to do. Yeah. I mean, for, for sure, what we will do, and this is one of the things that we're still struggling with, with is the GPSs. So what, what the plan is, is to have the GPS not giving you super accurate absolute positions, but actually a super accurate relative position between the transmitter and the receiver with centimeter, I mean, one or two centimeter accuracy. Because initially we thought we would invert for the distance between the transmitter and the receiver. If, if they were sort of bumping and going a little bit back and forth, you would but just put it in as an inversion parameter, like for, the, for any offset, off, fixed wing system, right? Yeah, yeah. But we don't think that's necessary if we basically have that relative position with a, within a, a one, or one or two centimeters accuracy. But that is still to, we, this is something that we're still struggling a bit with. So at this point, we're just inverting with the, the known distance if every, all the cables are straight. But then I guess for Nelly's data, you can always go to linear data space, right? And it's nothing against Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think it necessarily becomes a problem because I mean, the inversion handles it and the fault response handles it. It's just there is a little bit about data uncertainty and what you do when you have these signals in IT. Yeah, right? You need to be a little bit careful in how you assign noise and, and all these things, not to be able to have a robust inversion. But if you have both a, a, an absolute contribution and a relative contribution exactly. to the noise, it should take care of itself. So. But ideally, we would we would want to just some noise based on the stack because we have a lot of 
data in there. So you know the orientation of your transmitter, do you? Yeah. <coughs> well, so if, if you're going up, I mean, suppose you're going up over a, a bit of a hill or something, so you're, now your transmitter changes like that, right? And in, in Denmark, you would don't, you don't find many hills that are more than one or two degrees. Okay. So, all right. <laughs> I think we have other problems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Quite well taken. Well, also, that, you need an that, ATV. That hill looks, uh, you need an ATV important. that can pull it, basically. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so even easy. though with a four wheel drive and you're out and it's wet and, and steep slopes, you, you can't drive in there. You're up the slope yeah. anyway. <laughs> okay. But, but you're right. I mean, but, I mean, to the first order, we would just, we just uh, scale the, the, the transmitted field by. By the angle, right? Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's time to listen to Lindsay. <laughs> we keep threatening. You, do you want to sit here? Okay, so I just wanted to take some time and walk you guys through the resources we've developed, um, both in terms of like more the textbook style uh, resource uh, for the course, as well as uh, computational tools and the apps that we've developed. Uh, so the starting point to reach all of these is this website, geosci.xyz. Uh, if you go there, you can reach everything that we've developed so far. Um, so there's a few things to point out here. Uh, the GPG is an introductory style textbook resource uh, for geophysics. We found, um, well, we use this at a course at UBC. It's an introduction for geophysics. Um, it's taken mostly by engineers and geologists. So really, it's like a once over lightly on all the methods where you might use them. Um, and as we've been traveling around, we found that this is a course that's taught almost worldwide. And everybody is currently developing their own set of course notes, all of the resources, because there isn't really a textbook for it. Um, and so we're hoping that this can be a bit of a central place that people can contribute to and also draw from um, for that type of course. So I'll show you that briefly. There's also a whole other set of apps and notebooks that have been developed that run some simple simulations um, for things like magnetics or showing like a, a seismic and NMO correction and a lot of those basic concepts. Um, so this is a fully open source resource. You can come in and edit it. Uh, there's a there's a, um, a professor in California who's starting to pick up and use this, and he's been contributing and adding pages or suggesting that we, we start to add some pages and things like that. So it's totally meant to be a growing resource, and if there's something that you want to teach that's not included, um, there's there's certainly space for additions. Who is he? Uh, I can look. He was from, he's um, from ETH, right? Yeah. On pants um, really. It's Alan, I believe. Alan. Oh. Yeah. Um. Oh, Alan. Yeah, Alan Platner. Mm. Do you know? Him? No. no. Yeah, so this is um, one resource. We've also taped all the lectures from 350 from last year, so you can see sort of how these things have been used in one instance of a course. Actually, if I can just inter interject, so I, I think that was just kind of an interesting uh, event that just happened here. You're asking, you know, who, you know, who contributed. So Lindsay was able to go on, look at everybody who has contributed to to this and identify. So there's attribution here that you put on anything, change anything, you're there. The dates when they edit it or whatever you yeah. use. Yeah. There's this sort of a log on it. 
Yep, there's absolutely all of that. And what's nice too is it's similar to Wikipedia in that the changes are suggested, but we don't they don't go live immediately. Uh, they go through a review um, before that happens and we'll have a conversation um, and you know double check things. There are certainly typos in some of the formulas and things like that, but it's always good to have a couple sets of eyes before we change negative signs and such. <laughs> um, and then the one that's been developed uh, specifically starting for the disk is the EM module. And so this is more in depth, um, inspired a lot by Warden Homan and trying to get a, a level deeper. Uh, there's a couple interesting things with this style of resource. Um, one of the things that's quite cool is that we actually capture a lot of the way um, that figures are generated. So I want to show you um, one page. Here. And let's just get rid of the highlight. Um, so what's kind of neat with a page like this is that uh, here for the how this figure was generated, we actually have stored all of the source code. Um, so for a lot of these examples, like we're actually sort of uh, using basically like a documentation generator. Um, so if you're running open source code to generate a figure, we can actually capture that. Um, so if changes need to be made or if somebody wants to use this as a way to learn, like how do I create an image like this? How, how do we do that? Well, you can go ahead and have a look. Um, does that, does so, that mean that the contributors can sort of contribute in any kind of format which is open source and then you will convert it to a common form? Uh, so right now it interfaces best to Python. Um, but what's nice about Python is it is a glue language. And so if you have something that's written in Fortran or some other language, it's not too difficult to interface to that to then show how it's generated. So okay. if it's pure Python, it's very like it's very easy to do. Um, but if it's something else, we can certainly work with you to make that happen. Yeah, so that's that's one um, neat example uh, and something that I think our group has been pretty excited about. And it's also great because you can actually go back and there were a couple figures that we were looking at and a bit puzzled about. And you could actually go and find, you know, the typo in the generation of the figure. So it's not like the instructions for the figure have been lost. We can go back and actually fix things or see what somebody scaled it by um, and all of that. Source code, when you say that, is that only the plotting part or is it everything? It's also the EM part, so to speak. Oh, like in terms of... Um, the, the computation how at the fields and all those things is, is it everything when you take source code um, i mean yeah yeah yep. the whole thing is is stored um and it's tested anytime somebody changes something so we rerun all the all the computations when something changes on the site that's also a big validation tool at the same time yeah Um, and so these are all, of course, static images. And then if you want to actually go and run the more interactive uh, style where we can start to change input parameters, that's where we've developed the apps. Um, and so there, there's two styles of apps here. There's the EM apps, and that's what you saw yesterday, is those are really um, leveraging something like Jupyter to create an interactive interface. So we're not really exposing any code. The only code you see is basically like import an app display the app. Um, if you're interested in seeing how, like, well, what tools we're using and how we're actually solving Maxwell's equations, uh, we've gone through and set up a few simulation notebooks. And what these do is expose all of the code. So they walk through step by step, how do you set up a mesh? How do you um, put a model on the mesh? What are we solving? How are we computing our data? And all of that. So I'll show you an example of each of these. Um, so on the EM apps, there's a couple different ways that you can access them. If you're familiar with setting up a Python environment, you know, you've got Jupyter installed uh, and you want to download it and run it locally, you can access all of these through GitHub. Uh, if you're not, and even if, even if you are, I would still recommend first trying it through Azure. 
uh, notebooks, which is a Microsoft service. And so what they actually do is they will spin up um, an environment for you um, so that you can just run it on the web uh, without having to really deal with any of the installation and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so what you'll see here is there's, there's a list of apps. I believe we've got something like 26 of them right now. Uh, so the way that they're named is we name it by the method first and then a few descriptors. So we've got all of the DC examples. Um, there's some frequency domain EM, uh, marine CSEM, and then there's some time domain examples. Um, so if we go through here, right now you'll see that the, the run button is actually grayed out. Uh, so what you have to do is create a Microsoft account. It's, it's free. Um, but then we'll, we'll sign in. So once we have an account, you can sign in. And then you'll make a copy of the notebooks to your own account. And so what's kind of nice about that is if you decide to go in and make some notes or change parameters or anything like that, it'll persist and it'll be tied to your account. Um, so here, we're now signed in. And I can go ahead and actually clone this library. So now I'm just going to make make my own copy. Um, and so in this case, because we've already cloned this uh, to Doug's account, he's, it's asking, like, hey, do you want to overwrite this uh, or not? And so in this case, we will, because we haven't changed anything on his. Um, so we'll grab the most recent version. And now we can go ahead and actually um, run run these examples. So let's do this guy. So it's right now spinning up uh, a server for us somewhere. And so here we're now in the Jupyter environment. And so Jupyter is an interactive computing environment. It's actually language agnostic. I mean, it was developed first with Python in mind, but now there's a whole bunch of different other kernels that you can use and, and plug into uh, if you want to use Jupyter. But, but Jupyter was a thing that existed before you, uh, you, you didn't create Jupyter. No, no. <laughs> Most definitely not. <laughs> no, um, just to yeah. Yeah, it's a project that was really started um, by Fernando Perez and Brian Granger, and they're in the US. Um, and so it's received a lot of backing from some of the big philanthropic uh, groups in the US. So there's two ways you can run this. Uh, so you can run cell by cell. And so when I say cell, it's just a chunk of code. This is a cell. Um, so you can do shift enter, and that will run it one at a time. The other thing you can do is do cell uh, run all. So for the apps, that's an easy thing to do because these were designed to just be run so that you get to something that's interactive right away. Uh, so what it's doing right now is it's installing uh, this EM examples package. And so this is a package that um, is basically a, an interface layer that does most of the plotting and all of that sort of stuff that's been developed by our group um, for these apps. So SimPeg, which is simulation and parameter estimation in geophysics, that's the underlying Python package that we're using to actually solve all of the equations. Um, and then the EM examples is sort of just a layer on top of that. And that solves Maxwell's equations in one nature condition or whatever? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a quick tour of SimPeg as well. Okay. <laughs> and then, so with these, um, again, the, the package we're using to actually like develop all of these GUI widgets, that's not something that we wrote. That's leveraging the Jupyter environment. Um, so these are just called IPy widgets. And that's been a great way to develop you know, a function and then just say, OK, now I want all of these. I would like A to be a slide bar. And so it's a, a great way to develop and get code easily used by other people. Um, yeah, and so this is one way you can jump in and play with some of the examples that we've got. Are there any questions about how to access the apps, how to get up and running there? I know I blew through that fairly quickly. 
is there a tutorial or a tutorial tool on the web too, where you can sort of sit down and get slower than you <laughs> uh, There's some, there, sh there should be a bit of a write up on our, on EMGOSI. So on the apps, um, there's a few step-by-step -step, uh, instructions on how to actually go and run that. Um, we should actually, I don't know if we have step-by-step -step instructions written out for Microsoft Azure, but if you have questions, mm -hmm. you can ping us here and uh, we'll get back to you on that. Okay. Um, so, the next thing I'll show you is we'll go back to GeoSci and I'll show you um, what's there with SimPeg. And then we'll take a look at one of these simulation notebooks that actually walks through running a, an EM simulation with SimPeg. Uh, so SimPeg is, as I mentioned, it's simulation and parameter estimation in geophysics. That's what the acronym stands for. Uh, and this is an open source Python project that was started by our group at UBC uh, and is now, we're trying to branch out and um, involve a few others. So there's some students at Colorado School of Mines who are contributing, as well as University of Calgary. And so our goal here is to bring all of the geophysical methods into one place, uh, and so to be able to treat all of those consistently uh, and have them interface to each other. Um, and so I'll show you the docs, actually. That gives a bit of an overview. Let's start here. Um, so there's things, I mean, we've been using the electromagnetics module for a lot of the slides um, and simulations that were developed for the disk, but there's also gravity magnetics. Um, there's some fluid flow with Richard's equation and then some straight ray tomography uh, with seismic. And so the examples are actually the place that I would recommend starting if you wanna get a feel for how it works and um, what you can do with it because most of it is documented but you know it's always fairly dense to just jump straight into documentation uh, so there's a few examples that we've published um, that you can have a look at so if you've seen the the em paper these are all examples that we published in that paper that you can then go ahead and reproduce those figures um, there's a few examples that are perhaps a bit simpler so looking at a, just a linear inverse problem or if you want to explore different norms or things like that, what does that do in the inversion? There's examples showing how to set up a mesh, um, and then now method-specific examples. Um, so one thing that's important to show you here is that, and so examples can get you up and running a bit, um, but then often, you know, as soon as you wanna start extending, doing something new, it's very helpful to be able to contact somebody. Uh, so we've started a Google forum. Um, and so the link is just right here. You can reach it from the Simpeg docs. It should be on the readme and like, in, in most of the places connected with Simpeg. Um, and so this is a good place to ask questions and just get in touch. Uh, anything from installation to like, if you've got something specific that you would like to try, uh, this goes out and reaches anybody who's developing within Simpeg, um, like myself and Rowan and Soggy, uh, as well as a lot of people who are using and um, yeah, have a lot of experience setting up their own simulations. And so, with that. Oh, a couple other things to mention, um, just that are exciting in terms of the open source world, um, especially with languages like Python. I'm gonna show you the GitHub page. Um, Cause these might be valuable for others who are developing software is, um, the there's a lot of testing services that are available so for example when anybody changes a line of code in simpeg right now there's um like 80 percent or 74 percent of the code base is run is covered by tests so we'll spin up and run a whole suite of tests 
Um, and you can see you know, what's failing, what's passing, and all of this. And so this is with any line change of code, uh, which has been really important for actually inviting people who are unfamiliar with the code base to jump in and try things. It's because you can actually develop a little more fearlessly when you know what you've broken, <laughs> as opposed to turning something and then you have no idea what impacts that has upstream. And somebody will correct you. Absolutely, yeah. So then, okay, so what I'll do here is I'll now show you an example of um, one of the simulation notebooks. And so these are, again, also up on Microsoft Azure. Uh, so we'll clone this guy. And so there's a few examples here. We There are less of them um, than the previous one, because they are we're trying to meticulously document step by step what's going on. So it's a little more um, uh, work on the developer to make that happen. So there's a few examples you would have seen yesterday. Um, we've got the frequency domain sounding over a sphere. So that was showing uh, the comparison between the three loop model uh, with the two loop and a sphere. Um, so we've got that for frequency and for time. And then there is uh, a tutorial here on Magneto Telerix. Uh, and so we walk through, I'll flip through the notebooks briefly just to uh, show you what's there. We won't walk through this step by step. Um, but we walk through discretizing the 1D MT equations. Uh, using a finite difference approach. Uh, so we go through all of the details, gory detail, um, so you can see step by step what's going on there, where everything is discretized, so walking through um, the anatomy, so where where is the cell center, what is a face, how do we represent a vector in 1D. Um, we'll show setting up what the system matrix looks like in math, and then comparing that um, to what's happening in the code. So here we've got the, the math, and then we assemble all of the pieces and set it up in code so that you can see that side by side. Uh, and then we go through and solve that and create data, uh, and then compare that to an analytic. So this first notebook is just showing, you know, can we get from A to Z and compute a datum? Uh, the next one here goes through and looks at a couple important aspects of for. So that would be sort of a, you apply sort of a find a different solution to anything, whether it's one D, two D, three D, whatever. So you use the same approach. For for most of what's in Simpeg, we actually use finite volume. Yeah. Um, and so in that case, we have like all of the operators and all of that programmed up. Yeah. Um, for the tutorial. Showing the finite difference is a little simpler, but it's the same same yeah. principles. Yeah, yeah. yeah, meaning that, for instance, in the case of one D M T problem, the one D M T problem is really easy to solve without going to finite volume or anything. Yeah, but that's not what you do. So you use a standard method of finite volume, whether it's one D two D three D. Uh, yes, that's so we do finite volume within Simpeg as a standard approach. Yeah. Um, and I'll show you an example of that um, when we walk through. We'll go through the time domain example in just a little more detail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then the second notebook that we show here, uh, we walk through a couple important aspects, things like mesh design. So when you're looking at a, uh, an EM problem, we need to make sure that our finest cells are really capturing the highest frequencies. Uh, and that our mesh extends far enough so that the fields have sufficiently decayed. And we set up a couple widgets to show what happens when you break those assumptions. Where do we fall off of an analytic? And then the second example that's shown is um, looking at a classic example of non-uniqueness or equivalence. Um, so here there is the, the non-uniqueness with respect to the conductivity thickness product of a conductive layer. Uh, and so demonstrating that and thinking about these things before you get into an inversion. 
And all the code, code lines that you sort of been putting through here, they're in Python? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it would be possible to interface anything in Fortran, for instance, or it would be better to write it from scratch in Python? It depends on what you want to do. Um, so, like, in terms of if you want to create something that is interactive, that you can really interact with say, computationally, Python is a much easier language for doing that. Um, that said, though, if you've got an efficient um, function that you would like to then interface to from Python, that's not a hard thing to do. Um, so it would interface with a sort of Fortran DLL or something like that? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's ways Again, it depends on what you want to do, but you can you can basically if you've got just something that is a function that's written in Fortran, yeah. there are a lot of and utilities. Python will take care of it. Yeah, yeah Python so, will just. So you take can care feed a Fortran actually literal Fortran code into Python, and then we take care of it. Uh, you can wrap it, yes, but you yes. can like there's a function called f2py that you just then feed it the Fortran. And that will sort of translate it into Python. Yeah, it'll give you a Python interface yeah. to your Fortran. Oh, just an interface. It won't, it won't sort of translate all of the function code. And then it's better. It works. Yeah, I think that's right. I need to double. I need to have a look. Also, there's also an app called uh, MATLAB to Python. Yes, that's but that would actually that translate. That would translate. That'll all translate. Code, isn't that? Yeah. Don't translate the code. Just get an interface. Yeah. And in some cases, so you, you can actually just execute. say, "Oh." In, inside my no, Python code, this is a lot of Fortran, and then run your Fortran. Like, not a dot so exe, mm -hmm. but if you have the Fortran, Fortran like if you have the dot F9, Fortran, yeah. Fortran okay. then it'll compile and then yeah. yeah. this as yeah. double, double, whatever you have to clean it up. And that, is that also the way it works with uh, MATLAB? No, MATLAB translates. So it that translates the whole like code a, into like a compiler. Python. Yeah. It's like a MATLAB to Python compiler. That's way different. Yeah. And using terms of effort, I guess it would be easier to have an interface, a simple interface with Fortran code, right? Yeah, that's, that's very easy to do. The other way around, you lose performance. Yeah, I would expect that. So if you translate MATLAB to Python, something would be yeah, a miss. Those are basically it's equally bad in terms of performance, but if you can look at it as translating, say, C to or uh, Fortran to MATLAB, you would lose a lot of performance. But what I mean is, um, <coughs> uh, what I mean is also that um, I mean there would be functionalities and functions to call in MATLAB that might not be exactly copied the same way in Python, which means that there would be different patches and actually there are many good reasons to not do that. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas it functions better with Fortran because that's just an interface. You just get an interface, data in, data out. Yeah. Yeah, that's but then the idea is that you put there uh, also the source code for the program. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you would still need access to the source code. Or a binary. Okay. Yeah. That's what I mean by DLL. Yeah. Yeah, and then the final uh, notebook that we have with this specific MT tutorial is going through the inversion and looking at a few things to do with um, defining all of your parameters. So what's going on when you choose beta and your stopping criteria? What happens when you tune your regularization parameters? Um, just how, how does that change the, the model? So we've set up a few widgets to go through and explore that for a five layer model. And, and this is also a good example to get um, into the thinking a bit of how the, the problem is broken down within SIMPEG and just how the structure works and how we're thinking about the inverse problem. Um, so, because we do explain that in a fair bit of detail here. So the approach to regularization in the inversion is sort of the, the Vancouver approach, right? We've seen the paper. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, take, take your <laughs> but we ha we have tried to design it to be very modular and pluggable. So if you want to play with different norms or things like that, it's oh, not. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm not criticizing it because it would certainly be you know better than what a lot of people do out there. 
I mean, it's just that there are different approaches to the way that I can share. Yeah, absolutely. So this is probably a good example to walk through and just... Oh. Tell you about mine. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> We were going to open that up. <laughs> Maybe we're not going to go there yet. <laughs> it's always tomorrow. You mentioned not to talk about investors yesterday at all. Yeah, yeah it's true. true. That's pretty good. It's just a box. <laughs> it's a box. It's a box. Um, yeah, so the example I'll show here. Uh, there's two papers that describe the the SIMPEG framework. One is more talking about the inversion, and one is talking more about the the simulation, uh, and specifically the electromagnetics module. Uh, so the first paper, um, uh, they're both in computers and geoscience. So Rowan um, was the prime author in the first paper, outlining really the overall SIMPEG framework, and then more recently we published the EM paper. So in this case, what we'll do is we're going to set up, uh, we're going to use the cylindrical mesh um, because it's much faster. So it's nice to compute with interactively. Uh, we do have set up for 3D meshes, um, but then you do need better solvers and all of that installed. So in this case, what we've got is we'll have a loop transmitter. We'll put it 20 meters above the surface. We'll have an offset receiver. And then we've got our target sphere uh, buried. So the first time's thing, up. Yeah, time's <laughs> up. <laughs> <We're there. laughs> so the it's it's four o'clock. Is that like a it's alarm for the end of the day? Yeah, We're done. Now, now the doors are locked. So if you leave the building now, you're not going to get there. Four o'clock. Well, you can you have a card if you're allowed, right? So then you can. Oh, it's just visitors <laughs> to wake up people. Suspects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Canadians <laughs> got to keep us out. Um, okay, so the first thing we do here is install SIMPEG. Uh, and so if you're familiar with Python, you'll have seen um, pip, which is a, a package um, package manager. So you can install it through PyPI, which is nice and straightforward. Um, then the next thing we do here is import a number of standard Python packages. So NumPy. Uh, is basically like it does all the the matrix calculations, so it's a lot like MATLAB. Uh, Matplotlib does all the plotting. SciPy has a whole suite of uh, resources for scientific computing, so they do a, a lot of um, sparse matrix linear algebra. There's optimization packages here. All we're using is just the constants, so bringing in mu naught and strange functions and some strange functions. Yes. <laughs> And then within SIMPEG, we'll bring in uh, the mesh, a few utilities, and maps. So maps um, maps are a resource that we use for actually translating and um, playing with different parameterizations of your model. So generally, when we're thinking about inverting uh, EM data, we actually want to invert for log conductivity or potentially log conductivity of some active cells. Uh, so in this case, what we use maps for to basically translate our model vector to then a physical property on our simulation mesh. Um, so that, that would be a simple example. If you want to go in and parameterize something um, and do a parametric type inversion, that's, again, something that could be accomplished through maps. And there's a number of examples in the docs. Um, can you see that OK? Is that too small? You can go a little sort bigger. Kind of, sort of, kind of. Kind of, sort of. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Uh, and then we bring in also the time domain electromagnetics module, uh, which is in the EM part of SIMPEG, as well as a solver. So there's a number, if you go in and um, look at some of the examples of our larger 3D, um, there are a number of other solvers we interface to, like Paradiso or MOMPS or those kinds of things. Um, so the first thing we do is just set some parameters, setting up our model, just things that we want to be able to work with and name throughout. So that's setting up our model. We've got our half space, a very resistive half space, a bit of a conductive sphere, and more resistive air. And then we'll set the depth uh, to the center of the sphere as well as its radius. 
And all I'm doing, again, when I'm running each of these is doing shift enter. Um, then we'll set up our survey. So we'll set the height of the boom and how far offset our receiver is. Set up some times of when we want to sample and then um, translate now our parameters into 3D space. And then one of the important things when we're talking about defining a mesh is defining our diffusion distances. So we want to know that we're capturing the fine scale details and how quickly things are happening. Um, so from that, we're going to look at our minimum diffusion distance, and that'll define our finest cells. And then we also need to make sure that our mesh extends far enough uh, so that the fields have decayed and we can apply those boundary conditions. Um, so we want to make sure that we're at least uh, beyond this. Um, so in this case, we, we talk a little bit about uh, cell anatomy and, and just how you actually set up a mesh. Here we're going to use the cylindrical mesh. Um, so we set up some parameters here, define our padding in both uh, the x direction, so radial, as well as in depth. And then we define a mesh. And I'm going to show you something here. So um, Python is an object-oriented language. And so if you're familiar with MATLAB, you're probably thinking more in a, a functional way. Uh, whereas Python, we can once we've defined a mesh, uh, we now have all of the methods and properties that go along with that. So in this case, we could ask how many cells are in our mesh. And that's just a property of the mesh. Um, the other thing that we also have is all of the differential operators. So we have things like our face divergence or our edge curl. Um, because those are all just based on the geometry. So once we've defined the geometry of our mesh, we have everything that, that is associated with it. Uh, another thing is, is plotting. So we want to make sure, um, you know, visually, if we just look at our mesh, can we tell that we've gone far enough and are finally discretizing in the region that we care about? So once we've defined a mesh and our model parameters, we can put our model on the mesh. Uh, so we set that up and then can go ahead and plot it, make sure, do a quick sanity check. You know, we've got our conductive sphere, we have our air and our half space. And then we'll set up and define our uh, receivers. So we're going to listen to dbdt um, at the receiver location, which we set earlier, and the times that we are have specified. And in this case, we'll use a vertical receiver. And then we also set up our transmitters. So here we'll do a magnetic dipole source that is, again, um, vertically oriented. And we'll set a step-off waveform. So if you want to customize that, um, you could. And then here we just go ahead and, and print some information to show you know, what's going on. So we've got one source. Each source has one receiver that's sampling dBT at 30 times. So. so now we've got our survey parameters set up. We've got our model set up. So we can go ahead and actually run a forward simulation. Um, so here we're going to discretize more finely in time than what we're just listening to. We need our appropriate time discretization. Uh, we're going to solve Maxwell's equations in 3D. Solver. Um, here we go. Okay, so that actually. Is that time stepping solver that you use here? Or do you use, oh, or do you sort of solve the problem in the frequency domain and transform it? We do a time stepping okay. for this, yeah. Um, so we can go ahead and then solve with the sphere. So we're doing 80 time steps. Um, six of them are distinct time scales. Uh, so we solve with the sphere, and again, it's quite quick because we're on the cylindrical mesh, so we've eliminated a lot of degrees of freedom. And then we'll solve without the sphere, because we want to be able to compare and make sure that um, we can actually see the sphere. And then from there, this is just a bunch of plotting code to go ahead and actually look so one of the things that we've we've tried to do with Simpeg is give hooks throughout all of the code. Um, so in this case, one of the things that you want to be able to do is look at the magnetic fields and look at the currents, like what we were showing yesterday. Um, so here what we've done, I mentioned this before, this IPy widgets package. So all we've done is said, I want basically to be able to interact with my function that I've written above 
called plot dbdt sphere. And I would like my time index to be an integer slider. And then from that, we actually just get this little interactive widget. So we can then go through and scroll with time and see what dbdt is doing through time. So that then gives us our um, magnetic fields everywhere. <coughs> um, but what we really care about here uh, is the receiver. And so what we want to do is grab data um, from that. So we'll look both at the data with the sphere and then just the background. And we can plot and compare those um, to see if we do, in fact, see the sphere. And we'll see if our server is still running. Maybe not. It's a dangerous thing with live demos. <laughs> That's funny. So every once in a while, this does happen with um, because you know we've spun up a machine somewhere, and so sometimes it does you lose connection or something like that. Generally, the thing you can tell when it's thinking, and this is why I think there's a problem. Um, so this dot will be filled in when it's thinking uh, and open when it's done. Um, but right now, it doesn't look like it's thinking about anything. So let's just restart that. Let's see if it restarts. So we don't need to necessarily reinstall because it should be installed. Yeah, and now it's running again. So see, each time I um, hit a new cell, well, you'll be able to see when it's thinking a little harder. So here, when it's computing, it fills that in, just a little visual cue. And then from here, hopefully, there we go. Um, so we can now see our data through time uh, for the background, and then when we include the sphere. The fields that you can show, you show the magnetic field, is what? The magnetic field, the time derivative of the magnetic field, the current density of the electric field, or? Yeah, any of the above. Yeah. Show current potentials? Uh, we don't have them computed under the hood, but it's not a hard thing to to get to, yeah. Yeah, are there any other questions? I know that's a, a quick overview, um, but hopefully gives you a bit of, a couple of resources and places to start. Um, I'm deeply impressed. <laughs> very I am glad to hear it. Maybe just out of curiosity, Doug, or is it worth an answer? Who paid for this? I mean, a lot of people invested time in getting this started, right? And at some point, you can probably get it running by user inputs. Yeah, but there's a all, lot of stuff that needs to be done just to get it to this level. Yeah, it's all been done with money that I've been able to scarf up from here and there. Nobody will pay. So it's not specific projects no, that, nobody that will you pay. applied for money to do this. They nobody will pay for anything like this. You, have, exactly. you somehow have to, funny so we've got research funds that do other things and you're just continually grabbing here and grabbing there. And, and insist that to, everyone <laughs> ships it. Yeah, but they don't, they don't know. It has to be money that's kind of left over from other things. But no, for, for things like this, it's just very, very difficult to uh, get funding for this or the other thing that we're concerned with is technology transfer. Like once you have codes that are, are developed, and, and, then to you know, and just try to get, you know, get utilities and engineering software that just allow codes to be used, right? Yeah. You cannot get, very, very difficult to get money for that. So uh, unless the only way for that is you actually get, you know, companies to, to sponsor that because it's going to be a benefit to them, but you can't, can't get without research funds. Without them getting any proprietary rights. Right, yeah. yeah.
So it's interesting. I've got a uh, a consortium. It's actually called GIF Tools. So it, it's basically um, kind of a trying to develop a computer uh, computational environment that you could use all of the UBC codes because uh, we've been developing inversion codes for you know twenty five years, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of codes that um, you know we've distributed to to companies, but you know, they're not really being used because it's cumbersome to use them. And now more and more, we want to you know, bring in other pieces of information so that you can do things cooperatively or at least have some constraints. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of cases, it's just almost engineering software, right? So it's not research. Uh, so companies are willing to put some money into that, but you can't get a government agency to, to, to do that. And the last thing, last thing they want is technology transfer. We, we've got a group uh, in Canada called MyTax, which is basically uh, a, a group that's trying to, it's trying to foster uh, a liaison between industry and the university. So it will, if I get a dollar from industry, then I can get my tax to uh, match that amount of money. And that can be paid to what are called interns. So they could be graduate students or postdoctoral fellows uh, with the idea that they're going to interact closely with the, with the company. And then you have to write a, a research proposal to do that. So that's, that's fine. But the major thing that we really wanted to do that really would be useful in this last case is to have this computer environment GIF tools developed so that companies can actually use things. So from the company's viewpoint, technology transfer is important. From the government's viewpoint, we had to get rid of everything that had to do with technology transfer and basically take whatever else was done, put it into a proposal and say, okay, here's research. But it's, it's just really interesting that there's it's so difficult to get funding for things like technology transfer, things like this, because they're just not, yeah, just so hard. But anyway, we've got a great group of people, and it's been, well, I guess Lindsay's been, she's been a real prime person in the development of all this, and you've really been working on this for four years, and then I've got a lot of, basically, all the other graduate students just, just kind of working and uh, contributing and well, just gradually I'm building this up. When I said it's also about developing the culture in the research group that you have in Vancouver saying this is what you do. I mean, if you're a master's student here, you are actually expected to just mm -hmm. as a kind of normal social behavior to at some point chip in this. Yeah. So I'm actually extremely proud of what uh, this group has been able to accomplish. This you is should. huge, I'm, I guess I'm huge sure. amount. Very impressed. Can you bring back Ian Giusson? Because uh, speaking of contributions, huh. <laughs> um, so you notice that on there, there's, there's the, just the pointer. So this is a resource that um, can be used in many different ways by different people um, for students or for somebody who's trying to learn uh, about electromagnetics you can either you can kind of take it from the top down if you like you can think about you know physical properties and then this quantity in here is Maxwell uh, fundamentals so we actually go into all of the people that have been uh, important in developing different parts of Maxwell's equations and you know there's every equation is there taken uh, yeah, taken apart so we've got Faraday's law, Ampere's law, you know conservation of charge, there's, there, there's things like this and you know those can get d developed down and yeah. there's there's a lot of people you know the, the big EM names are, are, are all there so we, we actually spent quite a bit of time doing that and then uh, yeah so there's you know har harm playing waves and stuff like that are, are in there then we go from there to uh, 
the frequency domain, what was the next? Oh, so we went to statics. So, you know, again, governing equations, talking about DCR. We had, there's a placeholder for MMR we're trying to get all we, we don't have it filled out yet. Uh, and then there's frequency domain EM, in which there's a lot of material, as well as in time domain. So those are kind of the, that's really the fundamentals of things, right? It's all the equations and trying to get the physical understanding of what's going on with charges and currents and propagation, right? Then we come to geophysical surveys in which we've got a, a, a number of things there. We've got DC resistivity, induced polarization, and, and each of those, they have, they're, they're structured so that they've got, you know, the physics, what's the survey, what's the data, what's the interpretation, what's the practical consideration. So we're trying to develop that. We'd ultimately like to fill this out that for any kind of geophysical survey you could do, you could go there and, and that's how it would be parsed out. What's, what's the physics? What's, what's going on there? And then what is the survey? What are you using for transmitters and receivers? What are your data? What do you do for processing, interpretation, and what's the practical consideration? So that we're trying to do. It's also an, an amazing resource for, I mean, in, in many parts of the world, the universities that you go to don't really present anything of this quality to the students. And I, I mean, when you, when you look at the questions asked on LinkedIn or whatever, whatever on Google yeah. all over the world, you get surprised about the the depth of ignorance, sort of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and to be able to sort of have a resource like that would be an incredible help for a lot of students in not so well off countries where educational systems are not sort of to the standard that we have here. I mean, this is, this is a great offer for them to actually learn something the way it should be taught. And um, so I was actually, I don't know if you, if you tried that, but I was thinking maybe you should go to the um, um, sort of the aid organizations. Maybe you should go to the United Nations. Aid organizations, whatever, whatever. There are educational branches in these places and say, we have a resource here which is just really good, especially for education in not so well off countries and we just support this and this is what it is. And what I'm yeah, I, I think we're actually getting to the point where we can do that. You have to, you have to you have, have to enough. Have you have to have enough stuff done. And I think by the time we finish the disc, uh, that we might be at that position. Your comment is really interesting, and it was actually that is a a motivating factor for us to have gone this route. I did a, a distinguished lecture tour for the SCG in 2012. And one of the places that I went to was the, the Philippines. And there, there was the, the head of the university, uh, well, head of the geophysics department there. Uh, I, I, you know, distinguished lecture, you come in, you parachute in, you give a talk for an hour, and, you know, there's lots of hustle bustle, and, you know, it feels right, right, <laughs> whatever. And the students get excited, and then, uh, and then you disappear. But before I left, I, I had a chat with the uh, with this head, and he said, "You know, Doug. He says that's that's great. You know, you, you come in and you, you know, you're enthusiastic, but you know, you go away and then what? then what, right? And that really prompted me to think. And and, and what are the options? Well, the options are they could send students abroad. Okay, that's one way of, of doing it, but that's a real risk for anybody who's abroad. Right? That's that's a risk for for me to take on. You know, somebody you don't really know and what the background is quite and the cost. You know, so that's not very good. The other and a is a lot of them don't go back. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So then, have you really helped the situation? And the other is that uh, you know you could go there as a professor. You could go there, and you know, six months you maybe reach some people, but really, neither of those are particularly practical. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that what has to be done, there's this, there's this really viscous layer of, in, in a lot of these third world countries where, you know, the quality of people that they have at that professorship level is just 
not all that great. And the students, even though they're really bright, you know, can can only rise so far, and then that's it. So you got to somehow jump that gap. And you know, the realization there was that what we need to do is to have some way that students there could have material easily and uh, you know be able to access that and also have access to other people with whom they can ask questions right and so that's been a, a real motivation for the development of this disc in, in this way and uh, yeah we've got some got some tentative plans for a, a bigger kind of umbrella just open geophysics that would kind of encompass all of this and I think you know, perhaps that might then be more of a platform to go to a, an aid agency. Gates fund, you should go to no, no, we haven't really looked at anything. I, I think we just felt like rather than trying to get, you know, smaller amounts of money, as long as we can kind of bootstrap things along, we'll try to build it up to the point where, you know, especially after we've traveled worldwide, maybe we've got a, you know, kind of an international reputation yeah. and people would say, yeah, yes. This is this is a great way to go. Let's support this and then put your efforts into that. But that's also why I suggest the Bill Gates Foundation because it actually gives good slots of money, which will sort of carry you quite a bit into the future. Yeah. It's not just a trigger here to develop another app. Yeah. It's sort of much more. The scope is much wider. Yeah, because we we the amount of money is. Yeah. That's right. So you might you might as well have big money. You know, we got our we got our fingers burned really badly on this disc, right? Because SEG is willing to fund the disc one day, one person in a traditional manner. What we wanted to do was to, and, and you can see that we need to have at least oh, a couple people, yes. right, uh, going around, and we also wanted to have multiple days. SEG would have nothing to do with that. So we spent all of the last SEG basically talking to people like Schlumberger and Halliburton and you know, SEG and you know, trying to get extra money to do this, right? And in the end, we spent a huge amount of time writing a proposal. Schlumberger were asking like, okay, could you possibly give us 50,000 bucks so that we could go ahead and, and do this? And we, you know, we thought we knew all the right people. Got up to the top, and they said, "No." And so you realize, like, you're spending all this time. There's nothing fruitful coming out. So that in the end, the SCG is funding part of this, but actually, geophysical bird facility myself really is funding the rest of this. So it's kind of self-funded, but. I mean, eventually it's it's going to work out. But are SEG making money in this? No, I don't think so. Uh, although I, <laughs> it's really interesting because when we talked to the to the SEG about the about the desk, um, you know, there was a lot of talk about money, <coughs> and there was one point in in the in the conversation that uh, I was reiterating like what had gone on and. One of the big things was, you know, that the SEG wanted to be revenue neutral. They didn't want to lose money on this because they just gone through that. So, so SEG sponsored, sponsored in terms of going neutral. Yeah. yeah so that was one of the mandates for is SEG is that they wanted, they wanted to be revenue neutral. Right? And so the way in which they would ensure that is that uh, something would be advertised. And that there'd be enough people signing on and paying the dollar amount that is required, and their dollar amount was high, uh, so that you could finance an airfare and you know expenses and an honorarium, right? Okay. Uh, but at part way through this conversation in trying to figure out how it went, uh, I reiterated what had gone on, and I said, "Yeah, and one of the things that the SEG." would like to see us do is to be revenue neutral. At which point the president or the incoming president just stood up and he's a big guy. So up at the table and looks at him and says, no. The disc must be revenue neutral. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That, and that kind of said it, right? And so you can see what so we have felt that we wanted to go around the world 
and you know, we want we wanted to get a hundred people. That's what we had thought. We we should be able to get a hundred people in each place because what we're offering here is applicable to so many people. It's it's applicable to the geophysicists, it's applicable to geologists, hydrologists, <laughs> so many there's so many problems here in which you know. So money should not be a barrier here. Somehow it should be offered inexpensively so that people can can come and just learn and advance the field. That was that was our philosophy. But there has been people interested from Denmark that Pardon couldn't me? go because yeah. of the press. Do you have sure. that documented, or do you know, like, because if we could actually assemble I can a get number, a that would be, that would be, that would be helpful. Because that actually, that would be, 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 people who show up, but we can't get feedback from people who didn't show up. <laughs> But that would be, I don't know. Yeah. 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 So and for the record, for the recipe, we didn't get any of the two hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> We're not really going out with that. Yeah. Well, the, there is an SDG foundation. Not even for the sandwiches. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Oh, go. They, they're on us. <laughs> uh, well, I'm I'm truly grateful for all that you and Espen have, have done because I mean. Without the local host really being involved here, it, this just wouldn't be happening. And even mm -hmm. even now, I mean, you see the miscommunication, the lack of communication, with the SEG. I mean, it's at some point we wanted to book the the Sir auditorium, the big auditorium halls here, yeah. but the university actually charges also money for internal people coming in. Mm -hmm. oh, it's just like, well, <laughs> it's a local, we can't do it. <laughs> no, no public no. management, no. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that, that's just crazy. Yeah. Anyway, that's kind of where we are. It's been an interesting experience. <laughs> but if you, if you come back here, so now we've got geophysical surveys. So there are there's still uh, there's still gaps in here. But you know there are like here's where people who are involved, like the SkyTam groups, right? I mean, there's a lot that could be contributed here in airborne time domain EM, right? And, and, you know, and this is what we would hope that could do, and and that that advances. You know, sky can it advances the community, and yeah, there's and there's a plethora of case studies. You know, okay. it's just a, you know. Well, I think for case studies for for here, it's it's not that we want to no, not grab in, in exactly this context, but yeah. in other contexts around in this website. <laughs> right, but what we're looking for here, uh, I think, are case histories that really make an impact. Like they're just they're kind of like no brainers, so that when people look at you know look at what the site is, if there's a paper, there's a formative paper down there, and then there's a, a crazy a case history that's sitting above there that can kind of link to the paper, so and that those crazy case histories are just like a no-brainer impact. You know, somebody who's not familiar with things can kind of come through and like, oh my God, you know, electromagnetic geophysics could really do that. That's that's impressive. So that's that's kind of sort of what we're looking at. So yeah, so we've got a whole section here on version, which we're dying to get to. Uh, we just haven't been able. It's a placeholder pretty much at this point. And then the case histories I've been been talking about. Uh, before. So here's the other, so one way in which this resource can be used is from the top down. Let, let's go to the basics and go through, you know, all the way to geophysical surveys and then to case histories. Perfect. The other way you can use this is go this way. You just know nothing about anything, right? And you go to a case history and you say, oh, cast it. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a water problem, right? So, let's, so then we go to, let's go to cast it. Where, where would we go with that? I'm not sure. That's a, I mean, that's a, a bit. Place where I'm yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so that's how many links we've got. But this, this one. one. Pardon me? This one probably doesn't matter. Well, let's go to MIM. We'll go, we'll go do the mild eyes there. Okay, so this one's, this one's carried out a little bit better. But you, so you can see, so there we've got the seven steps, right? And uh, now you come across a word like uh, direct current resistivity, right? So if you clicked on that, 
that would take you to the surveys, the DCR surveys. And then in DCR surveys, if you click on that, there might be something about you know steady state Maxwell's equation, so that you link back to there, right? And then oh yeah, we've got electrical resistivity. What's that? So that gives, takes you back to properties. And so you can kind of you can kind of mosey around however you want, right? To add, to have in front of your face the information that you need at that time to answer that particular question. Accomplish that. Then it's much, it's a much more valuable resource than a book, right? Because in a book you lose track of where you are. And a lot of people would be able to say, well, I have a problem, let's see where these problems define, go into case history saying, oh, I need to learn about this. They would learn about maybe not to actually do a survey planning, and then they would go ahead and do it, and they have learned a little bit. Exactly. Instead of, you know, five years at university or whatever. Yeah, so that's. I mean, that's what we're hoping that this will be just a really practical resource for all kinds of people, for for the researchers who are trying to do something, and uh, yeah, and then when you connect this to SIMPEG and all of the computational abilities, yeah. then you really start to have something. And I think, so, I mean, one of the things I'm really optimistic about is it's just that there's a potential really shortening of the time that's going to take for researchers coming into the university to really get up to speed because that's what we're seeing you know these days yeah if somebody comes in and they're you know the state of the art is you know 3d electromagnetic problem well that's a that's a long time to kind of get up there even to do the forward problem if you're developing everything yourself so you just you just can't do that it just takes too long so you need to have you need to have a lot of stuff that's already developed, you could use that as a template, and then you make some some changes. Yeah. And then you also that prevents rediscovering the wheels. I mean, I've got some exactly. a lot of problems in electromagnetics. I must have had ten, you know, ten students that have done the same thing, and you know, we, we always remember, oh yeah, you know, didn't you know, didn't he do that? And the code must be somewhere, and can't find <laughs> it, and it's just final version six stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so yeah. That's a couple of yeah. So I, I think this yeah. all has the potential to uh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, that's our that's our goal. We're and we're. Make it around the world. This is the end of the European trip. I must admit, this has been a highlight. This has been, I have been so pleased with today. It's been so great to be talking to people who are just genuinely interested and who have so much to offer. I've learned a lot today. There's all kinds of things that just sort of came up. And uh, yeah, I, I just, Really pleased that we managed to come to our house. I'm very thankful for you guys. At one point, we weren't sure that it was actually going to happen. Yeah, and in terms of contributing, so there's plenty of ways. And if there's ideas that you have in terms of code or content or anything like that, please get in touch. Just one comment. I just yeah. had to spend a little bit of time just browsing around. Yeah. Something that we, or at least I, spent a lot of time on following Nils's uh, tradition, I would say is is uh, talking about uncertainties and sources mm -hmm. of error and understanding all these i mean all the equivalences that you end up with arise from your error bars right in, to some degree and and i think that part of this i didn't find in in the sort of, sort of no, discussions yeah. on sources of error and what to no. i mean the, that whole understanding of yeah, things seem to be missing a little bit. Well, mm -hmm. it's not missing. It's it's, it's, not, it's not missing. It's not the discussion. Yeah. No, uh, it's it's missing only because we haven't had a chance to okay. do that. There's a lot of things in here. If you go back to M I M though, I mean, it's just you don't. Okay. Uh, understanding the data is just half of, of your problem. Absolutely. Right? You need to understand. Yeah, but see, we haven't got into the inver inverse problem at all. No, but I think Nobody also really even without to. discussing the inverse, I think yeah. just understanding what what affects your data quality. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 You can explain what, yeah, what you can explain so what, spherics what, for TM or no, yeah, yeah, having yeah. these. You can, these are your sources of. You can explain the issues in equality. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the the scope for those kinds of things and for additional <laughs> contributions is huge, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, we we've got a framework here, and there's sure. you know there's some stuff, but. There's so many important things that can be and need to be brought out, and you know if we can get people like yourselves that are you know this is you know, these are things that you're really expert in and contributing, 
I mean, how great would that be? But it's also because you're disconnected from actual service, aren't you? A bit. Uh, I mean, in comparison to how we are here, then I think you're often, I mean, you're much more on the theoretical side of things. So the actual actual errors that you are uh, seeing. Yeah, I mean, you learn a lot by the building instruments. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Going out yeah, yeah, I mean, sure. yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, we do a lot of inversion field data. Absolutely. Right, so we don't collect the data, yeah. but we, we're pretty tuned into a lot of yeah. uncertainty <coughs> and errors and you know, practicalities. I, I was thinking yeah. in terms of using, exactly starting to use some of this for for teaching, right? Yeah. Uh, these would be something that, that would be... Mm -hmm. I would add on or... Yeah, so that would, be, that would be yeah. perfect, we, we right? We discuss separately or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. so yeah. there's there's definitely room for all of those those kinds of things. And the whole issue of uncertainty, I had, I didn't want to, I wanted to raise it, but I didn't want to because, like, you know, it's a number of hours today, and you can spend days and days and days discussing that. You can spend half your life discussing that. I mean, I'm uncertain about how, you know, yeah. how much time we would need to talk about uncertainty. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, uncertainty is that I would say it's a huge issue these days. I mean, more and more people realize just how important it is to purvey some sort of understanding of what uncertainty really is to the end users of all that we do with geophysics. Uh, a lot of people don't understand it at all. And it's reflected in the contracts. You have to do this to 80% certainty. When you know that, you know, if you get within an order of magnitude, you're fine. You know, it's ridiculous. And the problem is, if you, if you try and say to these people, this is ridiculous, I can't do that. Nobody can do that. There's always some little of shop here saying, I can do that. And then they get money for it, and then they will do yeah. the project. So it's very, I've seen that, so, I mean, this is what happens in Australia. When, when you look at the contracts, or the, the, when you look at the demands of the contracts that are put on, for instance, Geoscience Australia, when they perform certain survey, is absolutely mm -hmm. bogus. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't exist, you can't do these things. So there's a huge perspective, and I've been sort of trying to preach that around for the past couple of years, whenever I had the chance to, to say that. Also, in the, in the industry, when you, have, um, when you have meetings with your end user, I think you should sort of start to sort of give them a very, very sort of, uh, very short introduction to what is uncertainty. Uncertainty 100 or 10 half or something like that, and just spend some more time with them and say you really have to understand what uncertainty is. You have to understand what it means to get a result which is actually uncertain. What does it mean in term in terms of the decisions that you want to make based on this afterwards, and so on, so on, so on. There's, and there's very little consciousness about it everywhere. I mean, uncertainty. Who, who has it? Who wants it? It's, you know, everybody just go, no, I, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Uh, and there are, only, yeah. there are actually very few people in government offices or end users in general that would actually be able to make decisions in the face of risks. I can only think about three organizations that can do it. Uh, insurance companies, mm -hmm. the military, and what was the third one? Oil. The oil industry, yes. Perhaps, because we actually do, we give ranges of what is the expected uncertainty of services we provide, our movement fee and stuff like that. And then what they usually have to do is because there's uncertainty on thousands different data they get. So if they just add the maximum certainty from all of them, they can't use anything. So they'll have to accept some kind of risk level, and that's in the task of the client or the end user to decide what is an acceptable risk. But that's actually a very big focus in the industry. When you deliver sort of to your client. Yeah, I'm working in-house, so it's kind of yeah. a collaboration between all different departments to, to decide yes. what, what is a, an acceptable risk level. Yeah. But someone has to take risk, and of course, that has to be 
someone who can carry that data yeah, if it fails, yeah. then they have to be responsible. Yeah. So this, that's okay, kind of why I'd it's like, been like It's been like in the 70s. In the 70s, you had to convince all the um, all the engineers that geophysics was useful at all. Because they would say, ah, oh, well, I just, you can't trust that anyway. Why don't we just go out and do a few, some drillings? You know? Then we really know what it is in reality. But geophysics had a lot to offer. It was just not, it was just not on the, it wasn't on the screen at that point in time. And people really had to be convinced. Mm. And I think we're sort of at the same, my feeling is we're a bit at the same point with communicating uncertainty and that everybody who uses results that are uncertain and who doesn't uh, actually also has some sort of uh, competence in making decisions in the face of risk and uncertainty. Mm. It's, it's, it's missing from, it's, it's certainly not in the lower way, Well, that, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, accepting uh, uncertainty and understanding what to do with it is, is definitely problematic. That, and that was actually why I was, I kind of mentioned that thing with the hurricanes. I just thought yeah. that was such a wonderful metaphor yeah. for, you know, people just understanding that there is some variability, but there is, you know, sort of a, like a swath there that, okay, yeah. I kind of trust that. And, right. you know, the more people can become, uh, you know, accepting of you know, uncertainty and risk. And, and everybody does. I mean, everybody's got some understanding about risk because you can't get through life without exactly. that. Yeah. But it's just that in certain circumstances, then politicians or who's ever making decisions want things done to, like, the accuracy of your... Australian contractors, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just impossible. So that we speak, then we're discussing it very often also, yeah. because it's something that our end clients would like yeah. to have. But then if we are contributing as part of one other several departments, then we still didn't figure the right conclusion to how to actually present a combined uncertainty. We can only provide it for our own geophysics. But usually they can't use it because then if they don't know exactly our assumptions, then when they look at the uncertainty, they will use the maximum. They'll have to use the maximum. So we have to collaborate with all the other mm -hmm. businesses like geotechnicians and stuff like that. And then to be able to assess what is an acceptable risk. And to give some lines on that. And that heavily depends on the problem you want to answer. Mm. Well, I mean, it's, at least it's very admirable that you try to sort of communicate that there is uncertainty in just how much you do. And uh, but then, of course, it's the question is, what does the client do? Yeah. If we just end up producing figures and with the conclusions of the uncertainty, they'll cut up figures and the uncertainty is forgotten. Yes. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, what I, that's what I mean when I say, you know, who, who's got it, who wants it, you know. Yeah. Nobody wants to wait for some. We don't want to talk about uncertainty. But we also have to face that some uncertainties you can quantify. Others, you just can. You can say they qualitatively, it's good, medium, or bad. And then you have to figure out how do you combine the quantitative with the qualitative. Usually, you get you lose things when you do geological modeling because you can't accept if you really trust that you can wrap everything up in a statistic framework. You might be able to come out with a number for geology, but otherwise normally you can't. So then you are, have some numbers from geophysics, but then you have a red or a green dot from, from the geology. How do you put that into the, the next thing that you have to, to do, for instance, the kind of flow modeling or transport modeling and then you just well it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. I think in some areas here in Denmark at least that I'm familiar with, they are actually starting to appreciate real uncertainties. So for instance an uncertainty uh, range for a, what's it called recharge area for a water extraction well or something. I mean, where's the water coming from? 
they know it's not just this area. They are starting to appreciate that you can actually support, supply some sort of uncertainty area. So I think it's it's coming. It's getting better. It's coming. Yes. But it's and so also with the many many ways 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 methodological ways. developments uh, in I mean MCMC, and you can you can do more of these things that oh. that can sort of capture some of these things, and and also I mean some of the stuff that Jeff Kerr's has been doing at Stanford is really 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 interesting. I think uh, I'm, I'm actually involved in a project uh, where we sort of apply to some money to develop. The concept of not sort of de delivering one product to the client, but you deliver a suite of models. Mm -hmm. So you start out with whatever you know about the place, geologically, hydrogeologically, you put that into a model, and then you use that as the sort of the seed okay. simulations. So you simulate thousands and thousands of models <laughs> that are all consistent with <coughs> the way it looks, kind of. And then you can apply this to physical method, or well, first of all, you should clarify your questions. What is it that you want to know? Uh, and then you should find um, a digital physical method or whatever to falsify as many uh, of the models that you have as possible, so that only the ones that are consistent with whatever data set you have collected will survive. So it's a question of, you know, you start out with the multitudes and then you shoot them down as best you can. And it, it requires two things, that you have a lot of computing capacity, but we have that these yeah. days. But it also, uh, in some ways, or it opens up the option of having very good, um, a very good discussion with the client. Because what you really need, if you take that approach, is to know how does the client actually define the main problem. What is the main problem? That's the question. Is, yeah. yeah. What is, is, is this... It's if it's a question of whether this water works over here, is that actually hydraulically connected to this uh, pollution source over here? That's what they want to know. Then you have to design the surveys that you put in in such a way that it falsifies as many of the models as possible. And then you deliver, what, 150 models to the client, 200? And they can count. You can sort of produce probabilities and say, well, in all of the models that we haven't been able to shoot down doing what we have done, uh, the probability of them being connected is 37%, because 37% you know, of all the models that survived show that. So it's a, it's, a very, it's a very direct way of communicating one of the certainty Yeah. That you see, you see the multitude of possibilities. Nielsen, in this approach, how much petrophysics do you need, right? Because I guess it's also difficult. It's not just possible. Yes, but is it enough what we have? In terms of falsification, right? For a connection of piece of articles or whatever, I mean, sometimes. Yeah, but that's what's, that's sort of what's in the sort of, you could say, that's the kind of considerations that you have to put into the uh, simulation process when you first put in Learning images is created by the people who know a bit, say so it could be like this, could be like that, but this is pretty much the range. Then you will create all of these models. It also permits you to ask questions like, what kind of measurement, where would be able to falsify as many models as mm -hmm. possible? And that's then, if the client wants to put in more money, this is what we do. It sounds very meaningful, but I don't see any clients ask for exactly that or accepting it. Actually. But, but clients never ask for what they don't know about. No. I guess it would be difficult to sell providing 100 models. You would have to try to conclude again one model and then the uncertainty or the risk of this yeah. being one answer. But there's definitely a lot of merit to seeing a number of possible solutions to a problem. It's very easy to interface with it, you might say, because you can, you know, you just spread out all these blocks in front of you and you say, oh, mm -hmm. this, that, this, that.
thought the Simpec uh, part was really good, and I'm very happy uh, that you presented it here because then I think Shanduka and Alice could finally see it. And uh, I mean, I think, and I, I think about it, right? Yeah, I think it's a very, very good way that you're doing things, and I think that way of coding things is the way uh, of the future, and I think that will pay off in, uh, in the long run. Um, so, and I'm pretty sure they were also very impressed uh, oh, with that. And yeah. Just question is how much effort nice. we need for, for, for contributing, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite yeah, yeah. small. <laughs> but just but that's, I mean, the possibility that, that you can do yeah, and how, true. in some ways, things should be done uh, to validate and. And we, we have tried to make it easy for people to jump in and get in touch. We've been filming all of our development meetings. They're all fun. I mean, from, I mean, from our side, it, by far the easiest way would, would be eventually <coughs> on the source interface. Yeah. We have all the source code in front of us, even delivering the source code in any yeah. case, with an interface would be much easier. Yeah. Because you know the code works, right? And you don't need to debug it. So you need only to play with the yeah. implementation. Yeah. Absolutely. But that would be, in any case, much easier to start from scratch, at least for me. Yeah. Considering how many on how many things I'm late every day when I think when the day finish. <laughs> no, absolutely. So do you have any specific piece of code in mind that you think like okay? Oh, honestly, I, I think in terms nice of in terms of teaching and, and from uh, I think would be I think the the simple one D forward for time domain IP where you can uh, play with the current waveform and show the effect of the current waveform, mm -hmm. the effect of layering eventually also in, in generating exotic decays and something like that. I think that one would be not too big. But do you already have that in yours? Uh, that's not hooked up to the core sim page yet, not the time domain IP. Yeah. So this was what I was eventually thinking about. Yeah. That would be that would be, be fantastic. Uh, you mean time domain grounded source? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, also things domain. I mean, would be the same. Yeah. 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 Everything's there. Mm. So something like where you can see. I mean, when you change. I mean, I, I see mainly in terms of tutorial for for field acquisition. When, when you change the setting of the acquisition parameters, how your data change. Mm -hmm. I think this something is highly overlooked in in action. And I see that this one can can be actually for students or users. We've also been writing sort of teaching material course notes really for the past thirty years in this place, and uh, built on each other's notes and stuff. And I think we have some pretty good sort of introductions on the level that you need for thirty years students or something like mm -hmm. that. And. Um, and they have been polished a lot, and there are exercises too, and solutions, and da 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 da. I think and that might actually be a resource. Yeah. Yeah. Exercises, I think, and questions uh, are pretty invaluable. That they would, they would be great, and that's something that we, you know, we haven't really had opportunity to kind of get around to because uh, you know, especially when you've got a uh, an app that you got, then. Yeah, to have a number of questions that can really lead yeah. people through that self, sort of self-learning process, uh, that would be great. And uh, we've, we've yeah, been trying we wrote to lecture that. notes on DC resistivity, uh, equivalences, a bit of inversion stuff, sort of quite qualitatively, you know, but mm -hmm. learn the principles yeah. and also about TEM. And particularly the TEM notes have been sort of picked up by Anas and Histon and work on further and mm -hmm. improve and uh, so there's 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 quite a resource there actually mm -hmm. but i think i mean once you're done with this whole thing i mean that would be a great next step to actually make like lectures uh, mm -hmm. using this material where you have like a, an actual course i mean and then people could make mm -hmm. their own courses in there or whatever using this material and you could have like weekly this is a seven seven weeks course or whatever. I mean, of course, it doesn't have to have any weeks or anything like that, but just so it's like 10 talks or, or something that mm -hmm. then goes through EM induction or whatever it is the, the course is about uh, with exercises and all those kind of things. I mean, that would be a great next step uh, once you're done, because this is more like a, a lookup book where you have all the resources, um, but 
if you just want to learn a topic, then having a book with everything is is often a pretty hard place to to go in. Uh, yeah, but there's there be ways of kind of combining the that sort of uh, overall material that we present in the disc, right? So we've got all of the you know that's that's sort of one way of kind of getting through the material. Now you take that, you embellish that with some material some substance from EGSI and then yeah. some other notes that you've already got and then some questions and some apps. I mean, you can see putting all that together and you then you've got now a yeah. kind of a self-contained package exactly. for working with, yeah. you know, And DC I think that's very really important because then, for instance, if Anas wanted to make a course, then he could go in and take that and just modify it and make, yeah. like, put, put up his version so you have, like, multiple repository basically yeah. 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 and different ways to do it multiple selections yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and something about here yeah. I mean I was we were looking also today with Anna about the use production topics where I more more familiar with and also if you have the idea of adding something where you put also some specific case history for instance the one about the drug permeability stuff that's mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. how do you deal with um, with uh, write publication with the journals coming I mean, true because of course all these things are under there those ones are not of course but they're un, under revision right and then uh, i don't know if we're going to pay for open open access or not but would be the case eventually to think something where the, the the paper itself is open access and then you put a version of it or a simplification or an extension of it there or how would you do that or how do you do that right now it's on a case-by-case -case basis so the SEG, we've been talking with them to, to get the case histories that we've used. Um, they, they've given us permission to repost figures and things like that. Um, otherwise, yeah, it has to be done on sort of a case-by-case -case basis. If the paper's open access, then great. That's easy to work with. If not, then if we can work with preprint figures and like you know, <laughs> slightly modified things or a synopsis, of it, then that's fine. But um, even with so-called uh, green access or whatever they call it now, uh, where you um, don't really pay for it, but you are allowed to put um, a copy of what you have done on your own website for a year after. It depends. Yes, on the for channel. some purposes of some kinds, and then that's perfectly allowed. Then it wouldn't be a problem to have links. You right. Say, you know, yes, and you link to the to the. Yeah, page. yeah. So you click and you say, "Here's the paper." You click on the paper. And it links up to where you can actually get them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's no problem with that. Yeah. But this EM material, I mean, I, I think it's very good, and I've been using quite a lot in the last six months. Uh, just going in there whenever I'm, I'm writing something or if I'm in doubt about anything. Um, so I think it's a very good material. I mean, it's still mm -hmm. under construction sometimes when yeah. I, yeah. I reach the area I want. But I mean. Well, no, you can appreciate, enough, you yeah, can yeah, appreciate exactly. how much material exactly. is, is actually so, in yes. here and how long it takes to get put anything yeah, in yeah. and get it correct yeah. and put in RST. Yeah. And that no, is I, I, the first time I actually encountered the material, I mean, that was, uh, I mean, I was sitting at your place, but I wasn't uh, doing anything uh, about it. I was just uh, searching on Google for the material I needed, and I ended up on GSI. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here, okay, so <laughs> that's, 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 that says a lot about too, doesn't it? So he, he comes, he's, he's sort of interacting. Wow, well, he's he's sitting in the same locality. And but is, says him that yeah, Google. but is he really interacting, right? Like we're doing this. <laughs> but all the organizations like ACG, ACG, uh, ENGE, they should have links in their websites. Through some, you know, to these web-based resources, links to this, and it that's also something that we we haven't pushed too hard yet because you know there are there are a lot of pages still you're going to hit that if you're perusing around that it's like sorry under construction. So uh, it's a question of timing, but it would yeah. be fantastic to get. Yeah. Just like when we're talking about paper financing, yeah. you know, when you reach a certain level, just yeah. Okay, guys, I think we should wrap it up. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for your presentations. Yeah, that was uh, really good. Uh,
we are so pleased yeah. with the presentation. This this has been really like the greatest disc lab day I think we've had as far as <laughs> yeah. you say that. No. <laughs> 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 you can go back and see the recordings. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's the most perceptive audience, the most intellectually yeah. stimulating audience. We've, we have actually learned, at least I've learned a lot of stuff today. And I feel like we've, we've actually maybe made some progress here on really trying to you know, achieve a, a bit of a goal, be a bit of a catalyst in developing a community. I, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm in this room to try to make that work and if we can somehow keep that going uh that would be great yeah. uh, the one thing i did want to mention is that there's not only this kind of material but there's also uh data sets uh that we would like to use as you know common examples so we have that opportunity to use the bupranong data so we've got permission to do that yeah. but you know there are other you know data sets that you know, might just be really interesting if they could be, you know, if we do something with them, maybe they could be also put up and made available, and then they're kind of test data sets, either for forward modeling or for inversion, but just, you know, just to share. Yeah, I think only, only the video data also complementary data, so for instance, for our, for all our you know, it has to be comparison. It's important to have the data, but also the data to compare with, yeah, also, yeah, 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 absolutely. It's exactly. very important because yeah. then you can play and see if you improve. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's exactly. Do you have any sections for all the systems, for instance, Skysim survey systems or anything like that? I mean, I guess it would be in their interest as, as well. Uh, we have yeah. their systems visible. I mean, I've been searching for uh, all these systems lately, and Skysim are the only ones who have good information on their website and uh, about uh, their systems as far as I can see. I mean, I've been looking at each and you so can the change, right? Yeah, yeah, but then I mean... Rapidly. Rapidly. Yes, but I mean, it's, it's, I think it's better to have some information saying this is how it looked at this point rather yeah. than it's impossible to find anything when I'm looking. Uh, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe they have a different... Exactly. Exactly. I don't know if the system like... Uh, it's <laughs> I think that's a whole other conversation. Can you point to where we can find the slides in this section? Yes. I, maybe I'm just, so I need to try to find it, but I, yeah. from the disk. Uh, so if we go here, normally this comes out with Melissa's email, but yeah. so on the schedule, sorry, that was quick. On the schedule, there's a course material. You need to go into the specific. Yeah, so here if you go to geosite.xyz. I, I think I clicked on the disk, there's also course material link. That, oh, yeah. On the, on the main disk. Yeah, uh, and that would probably just take you in geosite. Yeah. yeah, so what we've done is okay. like if you look just at the URL, it's actually just slash archives. Okay. So that would take you to okay, these guys. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs>